30, 31, because Saturday is okay. the first, I think. Just curious. So this is the, regardless, last uh, session. In March, we'll have an open session this morning, and then this afternoon have the opportunity for a handful of uh, agency briefings, and then we will call it a day. Next week, we will start our work sessions um, with the budget. So things are starting to move uh, right along. As always, before we uh, start, why don't we stand for a Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence. Pledge of allegiance, Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Let's start, I guess, from my left to your to right, uh, Commissioner Vigliotti. Thank you, Commissioner Rothstein. I, uh, I'll do my best to be brief this morning, touching on only, only uh, two things. I know we have a lot ahead of us today, and so again, I will do my best to be brief. So Monday night, I held my first town hall as a commissioner. It was well attended. I was very grateful for the turnout. Um, we had the sheriff, the state's attorney, uh, various members of the uh, county staff, department directors, and others on hand to answer questions from the public. Uh, it was a really, really well-run uh, event, um, and I'm incredibly appreciative for everyone who, who did turn out for it and who did attend. And, you know, you learn a lot, and you get to be able to disseminate a lot of information that might not otherwise get out to the the public and uh, it's interesting because you know having done it after the first oh and, and we have also had two members of the school board there as well um, and so it's it's interesting because after the you know, first hundred days you, you kind of get into a, uh, a routine where you're, you're, you're working and you're, you're getting out to meet with people and you're coming to the meetings and and you start to you know you almost start to feel like you're not accomplishing much but when you have a town hall or one of the things I did was I uh, with the help of uh, Chris Weinbrenner, I put together a uh, uh, sheet with all the things that we've accomplished, the things that we're working towards, or the things that we have planned for the future. And you really come to understand that we, we've done a lot. And I think it's to the credit of this board that we have put our, our you know, rolled up our sleeves and put our heads down and then gone straight into to this uh, task ahead of us, the offices that we've been entrusted with by the public. Uh, the second thing that I'll touch on very briefly, because I'll let uh, Commissioner Rothstein speak more at length about it, uh, we both attended the Vietnam Veterans Ceremony at the American Legion in Tawnytown last night, and uh, you know Commissioner Rothstein gave the keynote address, and he did phenomenally. He really did. He he you know, he the tenor and the the tone and all of the important uh, aspects of the day. And uh, it really was uh, wonderful to be able to listen to him and have him be the keynote speaker. And uh, that's it for me this morning. Thanks, although I don't use the words tenor and tone, but that's all right. <laughs> and we're getting there. Uh, Commissioner Kyler. Thank you. <clears throat> um, this past weekend, outside of uh, government stuff, we went to a 50th birthday party, and I just think it's, uh, um, I'll probably say this twice during this thing, but I love Carroll County. And it's just amazing the different people you see and uh, as you guys have seen in our first whatever 16 weeks when you go to something like that there are some staff from the county there there are people concerned about issues there and you hear a little bit of it but on a maybe a slightly lighter note so it's just fun seeing everybody out and about um, I also had a town hall this week, and uh, I really, really appreciate the staff here who came, spoke, answered questions, prepared stuff. Um, I, I personally felt like I started out a little rocky trying to share with people what we've done in the last 16 weeks, and when I do it, I get... I get second thoughts about do I add to this and do I add to that but um, people know what we did I probably could have skipped it but uh, again I really really want to thank everybody from the county including uh, the ones that are flashing the pictures and uh, and were there and helped with the sound system and and the, 
photography and film and everything that happened. I also want to thank, and I won't mention names because I'll exclude some, but all of the outside people that came and spoke, and, and I just think it was great. I want to thank Blue Ocean for allowing me to use that facility. I want to try to do multiple town halls per year and spread them out in uh, Manchester, Hampstead, and Finksburg. But I felt like this was the center of my district and a good place to start. And uh, I, I just can't thank people enough for making it a very good night. We had some very good questions, very good discussion. Um, several members, uh, Chris Hine, I don't know if he keeps track of steps. He probably walked about two or three miles going from <laughs> his seat up front to answer questions. And, uh, um, and many others like him answered questions that I probably couldn't. So not only did we hear from the community, but I learned some things last night too. So I, I, again, I want to thank everybody, including the community who came. I was somewhat surprised. I don't know how your guys were. There's a lot of people that don't want to come to the mic and ask the group a question. We ended maybe 20 minutes early. We were probably there 20 minutes late because of people that wanted to talk one-on-one -on -one with either staff or Carroll County Public School or, uh, or a, de a deputy from the sheriff. And uh, um, I'm glad they had that opportunity. But I want to thank them for coming. And a lot of people had some great comments and great, great questions. Thank you. Absolutely. Commissioner Gordon. Thank you. Uh, first and foremost, want to thank everyone that's been submitting emails and phone calls and any other version of reaching out to myself and my fellow commissioners as we are in the process of looking at the budget. That's all very appreciated and very important. And I thank you for all of those uh, comments and thoughts on the, on the uh, budget cycle. Uh, second, wanted to mention that uh, the other day myself and Commissioner Guerin attended the retirement party for a 42-year employee at Carroll County Government, Sandy Kiefer. Um, really would have to say it's 42 years of serving the public, not really Carroll County Government, and I thought that was exceptional and wish her all the best in retirement and all the things uh, we discussed that she has plans for. I think it's a well-earned retirement, and I hope that that goes very well for her as that uh, progresses starting now. Last night, I attended the Outstanding Teacher Awards hosted by the Chamber. Uh, it was an incredible event to uh, uh, be a part of and witness. 921 teachers were nominated this year, and the, the I guess I'll call them semi-finalists, are now eight, with the final uh, teacher to be announced in the upcoming Board of Education meeting. I uh, thought that was uh, just an incredible event to, uh, you know, be involved with our educators, appreciate all the hard work they do, as well as the chamber hosting that and everyone that was involved in putting that event on. And, you know, I, th I think one of the things we all really need to keep in mind is when you hear the term teacher, what is that? Well, obviously, they're an educator, could be in a variety of subjects, but, you know, and yes, they instruct, but they do a lot more than that. You know, teachers, somebody, whether it's formal or ongoing, not only educates, but they're someone that impacts far beyond the classroom. Teachers can be a mentor, confident, uh, confidant. And, you know, in a lot of cases these days, there's situations where children need that connection because of outside situations in their lives. So I just want to thank all of the teachers, not just the uh, 920 and the one that were nominated, but thank you to all of you for all your hard work. I know it's incredible hours. I know it's sacrifice on both you and your families, but just want to thank you for all the work you do for not only the students at Carroll County, but the future of Carroll County. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Karen. Uh, thank you, and, and good morning, Carroll County. Uh, I would really want to mention two things. So Saturday night, I was honored to attend the uh, Winfield Volunteer Farm and Fire Department's annual banquet as one of their guests and was able to speak to everybody there. It was a, it was a full house. As I mentioned, it was an annual event. And I want to thank uh, President Carl <laughs> Broussard and Chief Tim Lagore for, for allowing me into the fire, Winfield Fire Department and, and to learn what they do on a 24-7, 365 basis. I'm, I'm truly honored to be a part of anything they have going on there. And it was a great evening. Uh, again, they use it to honor the many, many people who support the Winfield Volunteer Fire Department. Uh, everything from top responders to top EMS responders 
to a Rookie of the Year, Firefighter of the Year, and they also honor the ladies' auxiliary fundraisers who it, we're talking about thousands of hours of fundraising by the ladies, and there's, there's men involved in the ladies' auxiliary as well. Um, so it was really eye-opening, and then what was really kind of astounding was to see some of their service award recipients. They had one gentleman, uh, Robin Lamb, 50 years of service to the Winfield Volunteer Fire Department. So I want to thank everybody that's associated with that uh, fire department again for allowing me to be there Saturday night, and I really, truly enjoyed it. And then yesterday I had the opportunity to participate in what's called, essentially it's a mock interview exercise at my high school, uh, South Carroll. Uh, again, I was honored to be there. It was pretty remarkable. They had 10th graders coming in for mock interviews. And they had people, they had parents, all parents, from different uh, backgrounds and, and uh, types of jobs who were there to interview these 10th graders as they came in with their resume to answer questions. The resumes were impressive for a bunch of 10th graders and uh, the staff there at Carroll County. Uh, again, I'm always going to be a proud Cavalier, but I was truly impressed with how that entire exercise was run. They had the National Honor Society making sure kids were getting in there. I call them kids. They were getting in there and uh, getting to the tables. And so, uh, again, uh, well done to South Carroll High School. I think these exercises are probably repeated throughout the county. And if you have an opportunity to participate in some of them, uh, all I can say is that it gives you hope <laughs> because, number one, it's, it's a, 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 an affirmation of, of what a great county school system we have, but it also realize, it make, helps you realize that we've got some bright kids out there, and uh, they're right here in Carroll County, which we should all be grateful for. All right, thank you. Cool. Yeah, That's you know, awesome. May I ask yeah. a question? I'm, I'm curious. I've, I've had a couple farming banquets. And the years of service and, and a lot of that stuff's amazing. I was impressed, and I don't know if you saw it there also, some of the guys with a lot of hours and a lot of calls were relatively young. They are getting some young volunteers. You keep hearing young people don't want to do this job, but they do. Most of the awards for yearly time, for yearly hours, were mostly young people. Wow. It was, again, it was inspiring. Yes. Would be the word for it. <clears throat> okay, a couple things. Um, and I did see a, a picture on the slide around the. What's that? Commissioner Gordon. Oh, did what, did you? you you're spoke. done? Yep, okay. You didn't listen to him? Well, no, no, no. My, I thought my question threw you was, guys off. I'm sorry. Profound and, uh, I didn't know if I interrupted. No, not at all. Um, on Friday, um, Carroll County government held a blood drive. And. <laughs> I'm smiling, I think. Well, I think blood is going through that thing. Um, it was a great opportunity for me because it's the first time I've given blood in a long time because of uh, deployments and, you know, all the way back from mad cow disease and all that kind of fun stuff. But uh, I was told I'm now allowed, and I was very happy to provide a pint of my blood. Um, and what was really cool about this is Every time slot was taken up. People were coming in, and uh, yeah, uh, every, people were coming in, and they couldn't get a time slot because it was all taken up. So, um, th there is a funny story to this one. Is just very quickly, it was getting warm in there, and uh, the gentleman get taking the blood said, "Hey, it'd be cool. It'd be better if it's cooler in there for more people coming in." <laughs> I said, well, okay. So I picked up my phone and I called Roberta. That's what I do. And I said, Roberta, it's a little warm in here. Can we get it cooled down? Well, Mr. Bokey over here heard me say this. He goes, you know what's going to happen? She's going to reach out and call me. <laughs> as soon as he said that, it texted him <laughs> and said, hey, can you go to facilities and get it cooled down? <laughs> So we got a, a pretty good chuckle out of that. And um, I got to see this photo on Friday a couple times. You did? Yes. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, okay. So um, so slide off of that, please. Um, yesterday, March 29th, um, was Vietnam uh, War Veterans Day across our country. And um, it is a, a national recognition um, to proclaim March 29th as a uh, Vietnam War Veterans Day, March 29th specifically because that is when the last combat troops left Vietnam. 
Um, it has been 50 years since then, and when the proclamation started nationally, it was 50 years from the beginning of the war, which started in 1964. Um, Commissioner Vigliotti uh, and I attended a beautiful ceremony um, up at the American Legion in Tawnytown, where uh, Commissioner Vigliotti uh, provided the proclamation to the American Legion. And the intent is to continue to promote the importance of uh, Vietnam War Veterans Day on the 29th because a lot of our Vietnam War veterans came back not in the best uh, care. Um, many of them, one, wounded themselves, and many, many did die, but a lot of them were were neglected, they were spat on, they had to go into the, the latrines or bathrooms and change into civilian clothes. It was just a very large disgrace, um, and we need to commit ourselves never to allow that to happen again. Uh, I was pretty proud. I had this really cool speech that I wrote, and Chris, who I am very blessed to uh, to look at these things and prepared it. And then I was at the bar having a beer, talking to somebody, and I was writing on a napkin. So I threw away my speech and talked from the napkin, <laughs> and uh, I felt it was much more appropriate. Um, not that I was at the bar drinking a beer, but that I was talking <laughs> what my initial thoughts were off this napkin and the importance of just saying thank you to those that have served um, and those that are continuing to serve um, and committed to not replicate the the atrocities that we did at home for those that served um, which then brought me into the next phase of what I was sharing and that is we have again like uh, Commissioner Kyler said, Carroll County is awesome. Our Carroll Countyans really know how to take care of people. The Veterans Advisory Council, with the transportation program, with the three veteran support officers that are part of our county government, you know, it is great. You don't need to go anywhere else but to Carroll County government to find how to navigate through a veterans uh, process through our veteran support officers. So I, I continue to promote that and I continue to advocate for all that are out there um, to move them into the citizen services, um, into uh, the, the veteran support officers. We don't need to replicate it in our county. We have it. We don't need to be so redundant when you have it and we all work together. Um, there's a large part of still Vietnam veterans that are still troubled and challenged and not taking not advantage, opportunities of, and I apologize being on pulpit just for another minute. Um, they're not taking the opportunity that they deserve um, to be cared for. And they said, well, I just did, you know, a year deployment and that's nothing and I'm, you know, back to normal. Well, it's not just for you, it's for you and your family and your children. And whether you have a disability of zero or a disability of 100%, it is still a disability. And there are certain um, honors and opportunities for all our veterans that have been honorably discharged. So I, I continue to promote it. I continue to promote the wonderful work that our, um, our uh, veteran support officers do in the county. Um, they are just phenomenal. Uh, and even sometimes I get calls from outside the county. And I'll reach out to them and they'll say, hey, this is who you need to contact. We are a very strong uh, partnership with the uh, Maryland VA. In fact, uh, Commissioner Kyler and I are meeting the new secretary next week to talk more about the programs that we have going on in Carroll County. The last thing um, is I shared was um, the importance of recognizing some of the challenges we have in ourselves, whether it be PTSD, anxiety, depression. <coughs> I've shared with folks that, you know, I have my own demons and had to fight through them, and it's a continuing fight. And, um, you know, I, I see folks and I'm cared for. It allows me to care for myself. It allows me to care for my, my wife, Audrey, and the kids and my community so much better than I could before. And that's what this is all about um it's about community um so just 
you know, it's a stigma that needs to continue to to distance itself from uh, from our community and ensure we, uh, we we take care of ourselves, our families, and our neighbors. That's what I think being a commissioner is all about. The last shout out I do want to make is um, the American Legion. I can't remember the post. What's the post number? Hessen Snyder. Um, Hessen Snyder is the name of the post. Uh, that's okay. I, I no, it. it's all good. Hessen Snyder, post up in uh, Tawny Town. Ethel ran the show, and she was awesome. Yes, she is. And uh, I think the rock star was who sang? What? Uh, uh, Vicky Bone. Bon. Vicky Bon. Oh my gosh! I mean, that woman had some pipes, and she could sing, and it was it was beautiful. It was just a beautiful ceremony. So shout out to Tawny Town. Uh, American Legion for putting that on and that is all for me at this time so I, I appreciate allowing me to take a couple minutes let's start unless uh, Mr. Post 120 Burke. what's that 120 post 120 okay unless Mr. Burke has something to say nope not today are you sure yes okay let's start with item one and that is with the library request of one-time bonus for Carroll County Public Library Please. Oh, thank you. Morning. Hello. Good morning again. Good morning. Um, oh, thank you. Twice in one week. So first off, uh, Commissioner Rossi, I want to say thank you as the daughter of a Vietnam vet who mm -hmm. served eight years. Uh, in country, uh, in the Navy, that um, I truly appreciate the support that this community gives its veterans. It's it's yeah. it's it's heartwarming and touching to watch the families being supported, not just the vet but their families. Absolutely, so, thank you. Thank you. Um, I we're here today to talk um, about the library's request for a one-time additional compensation for the library staff. Um, equal to the 10% uh, minimum salary adjustment that the county employees uh, were able to get last year. Um, we're asking for $892,532, which would provide those funds to staff who have been on the books at the library uh, during this fiscal cycle. Um, you've got the briefing paper there, and as a former teacher, I'm gonna assume y'all did your homework. Um, <laughs> But there's a few things that aren't on the briefing paper that I think might be relevant to this discussion. We all know that the changes and stresses of the last three years, the combined effect of dealing with the pandemic, uh, supply chain issues, and then these retirement and resignations um, has left many people feeling stretched and stressed. During that time, people have sought for consistency and reliability, and they find it in the Carroll County Public Library. Our staff of passionate, highly trained, and dedicated individuals have stepped up and delivered. Since Friday, March 13th, 2020, we, a date we will all remember very well, um, staff in the <clears throat> library have distributed over 195,000 COVID tests mm -hmm. and 33,000 uh, masks. That's something none of us anticipated. It wasn't in any job description. CCPL was among the first in the state to reinvent library programming, moving all our programs online so that parents and caregivers could still access story times, STEM programs and other educational activities. This included holding two virtual Battle of the Book seasons and two summer reading programs online, as well as numerous author visits. They created a means to provide contactless del delivery, that's one, that's a tongue twister, contactless delivery of library materials and books, including deliveries to local daycares and senior communities. For some customers, this was one of their only social interactions during the pandemic. They ensured that when we opened our buildings, those buildings were safe for us and our customers. And as the pandemic began yeah. to abate, that same staff took steps to bring back the beloved uh, services and programs that has made CCPL a top-ranked library in the state. In fact, we anticipate this year's battle season to be record-setting. Along the way, CCPL added new programs like Facts First and the Adult Battle of the Books. Both have been hugely successful. Oh, and did I forget to mention that same staff opened a whole new location, a one-of-a-kind collaborative learning space, providing makerspace and culinary education opportunities to the region. 
They created policies, procedures, and programmings that haven't existed anywhere else, and they conducted it so well that over a year later, Exploration Commons still has sold out classes every week. We invest a lot in our staff. We provide access to top caliber training and workshops. We encourage innovation, and we seek to ensure that the staff understand their importance. In just this last week, we hired a new library associate, a library associate level two. These library associate positions, along with our circulation clerks, provide much of the public service, the direct public service to the people in the branches, including checking books in and out, holding programs, answering questions, finding books, that sort of thing. This individual was hired to a supervisory position from Frederick County, where they were not a supervisor, but a library associate level one. They took the position, even though it meant a loss of income of approximately $6,000 a year. They went from non-supervisory to supervisory, and they took a step back in, in pay. That speaks to the caliber of our library. The people still want to be here and work for us. Combined with the inflationary stress that we're all experiencing and the labor shortages, this kind of salary inequity lowers morale. It makes individuals question whether what they do matters and whether it's appreciated. We're asking you to help us make the statement that they do matter, that the staff are appreciated by providing funding for this one-time bonus for an amazing staff. That's, that's the end of my comments. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Um, also in the packet we gave you, you'll see that there's um, our newest currents. There's also our annual report from the last fiscal cycle, which has a lot of our facts, um, our statistics, and some wonderful pictures. Um, it shows you how many visits we had, how many information questions we answered. It shows you how busy the staff has been just in numbers. Um, so for those of you who like to do dives into data, there you go. Um, What's the uh, total you. number of employees? 264 at my last count. And that varies. Sure. Yeah. Up or down a couple as, as we have people that come or leave. And the current operational budget? Ooh. That's a question for you, Jill. <laughs> I'm ready to hold it. I can tell you what the 22 one is, um, and that's in the annual report. It's a, it's a 11 million 467 thousand. But and this year's just a bit more. 2013 is 12 million 79 thousand 561. 2023, not 13. 20, that's what I meant. <clears throat> Sorry. Yes. That's okay. I just wanted to make sure we. Whatever. The same whatever age. decade I'm in. <laughs> and you have a operational reserve embedded into that. Correct. And that operational reserve is how much? $4,500. $4,500. Has it always been that low? No, that was, that's the effect of paying off Exploration Commons. And you paid off the Exploration Commons when? Uh, a couple months ago. About six about weeks a, ago. Yeah, I was going to say about yeah. a month and a half ago when we were, came before you about the loan. February 11th. Right. <clears throat> so out of curiosity, how do salaries stand poised in the coming year's budget? I know you're asking for the for a bonus today, Correct. but how absent that, how do the salaries look next well, year? Well, the salaries we we've an anticipated three percent cola based upon the recommended budget. Um, that's the only increase that we can afford. That's why when we were here Monday, we asked for the salary increases. We want to we want to bump that cola up, and we also want to restore a merit pay program to our staff to reward those who are really going above and beyond. Um, I think that was what 5.5 percent was the the rate that was that's quoted. The, that's the cola we would like to give, yes. And then there's additional funding built in there for merit pay. Right. <clears throat> and then so how is that? And, and forgive me if I'm phrasing this question awkwardly. I'm trying to. That's think, quite right. So so the the 10 percent that you're requesting today, how is that commensurate with that 5.5 percent going forward? Or would the 10 percent that you're requesting today exceed? what would potentially be next year at the 5.5%, meaning that there would have to be some kind of balancing between the two to make them equal. Well, this, this would be a one-time funding. The 10% the staff would, would, be, would receive that sort of as like a year-end bonus, or if you worked in the private sector, you would receive it as um, you know, end of the fiscal year bonus. Often when organizations meet their sales goals or their production goals, they're given one-time money. It doesn't affect the ongoing salary, and that's what we anticipate this being as well. So it is 10% of their current pay status, their current pay level, um, not 10% of next year's. 
So, th so this is more you're seeking. I know it's it's one time, but I, I guess like with, for example, when we had discussions with the state's attorney um, and the circuit court, the, the idea was that you know, the the bonuses that were provided to them would ultimately play out in their requests for the rates of pay that they requested for the f coming fiscal year. So for you guys, that's not the case. You just want one-time bonuses and then whatever the rate is next year is whatever the rate is next year. So financially, um, we requested a total of an 11% increase in our funding from the county for next year. That includes a 10% increase, 3% being the COLA that we've already been afforded, an additional 2.5% to get us to a 5.5% COLA, and then a 4.5% increase to allow for merit pay. To allow for merit pay. Right. Um, we acknowledge that funds are tight, so we didn't ask for the full 10% that county employees got last year. We right. are but hoping it, to spread that out. So I think, I think what Commissioner Vigliotti is saying is asking is the 10 percent we're asking for this year does not roll over there would be no impact on on the ongoing salary level it would be a one-time pay that we would give them and say good job well done you know here's this but next year's COLA whatever that is whether it's the three percent or the five and a half we'd like to give them and the merit pay would be based off of their current pay rate this 10 percent would have no effect on that so, so this really is a standalone. But so, for example, if if I was working for the library and my salary, and I'm just gonna throw out some numbers here, was ten dollars this year, the bonus might make it fifteen dollars this year, but my salary next year might be twelve dollars. Correct. Yes. So the bonus would only make it eleven, because <laughs> it's only a ten percent. Right. right. And I, I we would never out pay anybody that low just to say that, because it's not only illegal but immoral. Um, but yes, that would be it. It would be. It would be a one-time check. It would be once we would write that deposit, it would go into their accounts. And it's a, it's a way of saying thank you to them. But it would have no effect on what their pay increase would be for next year. And, and the view is that for the three years of service through the pandemic, this is an accumulated yes. bonus for services provided. Correct. Um, you compare with Baltimore County and Frederick neighboring counties their populations are much greater they are um, therefore my expectation is that their library workforce is probably greater as well I that is an assumption on mine because I don't that I don't know but I do know the populations are the populations that much greater in Frederick and Baltimore County? I mean, Baltimore County is significantly larger. Right. Uh, fully, uh, uh, Baltimore County with a full complement has almost 600 staff members. Right. Frederick does not. Okay. Um, Frederick has, I believe, 270 or 280 staff at the moment. But they are building new libraries to, to accommodate the growing population. I think their population is about 255,000. Right. So they're servicing 100,000 more people. Um, and so they are adding, they're actually adding branches, not just building new buildings, but, but going, <clears throat> growing the number of branches they have. And as they do, their staff will continue to grow as well. Um, so right now they have a small staff, but I expect that that would continue yeah. to grow as well. Okay. But you also have to, um, and I don't know if this helps you understand it all, libraries all are library systems are all unique okay because the community's right. need for what they want from their library is unique so some libraries are archives and they hold historical documents and their research facilities and some libraries are um, about collections and they're about books and some libraries are programmatically driven Carol is one of those um, we have a, a high rate of programs it's what the community wants from us the more programs we create the more people show up they love this aspect of library service but a programmatic library tends to be to need a, a larger labor force because programs yeah. don't run themselves whereas books can sit on the shelf all day unattended um, so that also explains a little of the difference between us and Frederick Frederick is a very um, collection heavy library right. they're very collection driven and that's what the community wants from them right. so you know we applaud the fact that they're running their library the way that Frederick wants them to but uh, for Carol this is how we need to do ours also, Frederick, 
their library rolls up immediately into the county, so they don't need all the additional administrative support that we have to provide. They're a full, they're a full department of county government. So they though. really are, that's really? the employees that yeah. are in a library. They're actually a department. That's not yeah. payroll, that's not finance, that's not human resources, where we... So more of their staff, staff are staff. able to be out in the public service where we need, because we're an, an autonomous entity, yeah. we have yeah. to have some of these other departments as well. Interesting. Yeah. Are other Good jurisdictions point. like that? Um, there's two or that. three, okay. not many. Yeah. Most of them, the libraries are standalone yeah. or independent. I think so. Yeah. Out of the 264, my last question maybe is, um, how many have departed over the last, you know, couple years through? Let's just say the three years. I mean, has it been specifically a, last year? We had 11. Okay. And the year before that, I think we had seven or eight. And the year before that, we had seven or eight. Yeah. Okay. Um, and this year, as of February, the end of February, we've had 11. So if we turned that into an annual number, it's probably going to be more like 15. Mm -hmm. And then we, we shared numbers with you on Monday where that we anticipate about 30% of our staff will retire in the next five years. Right. Okay. <clears throat> and, I, and I've mentioned a few times, and I think it's also been mentioned that in the case of the Mount Airy Library, it, it essentially serves as Frederick County's library for a lot of that population, which is fine, by the way. Nobody's complaining about that. No, no, no one but, is, although uh, they do plan on eventually building a branch on the other side of that boundary line. That's what I hear. That's <laughs> what I hear. We'll see. We'll see. Because they've already got a great library in Mount Airy, so, you know, we're sort of a, a victim of our own success there. Uh, we really are. We, we are. We are. And I, uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't be more right. Uh, so my, my, my opposition to to bonuses and, and one-time additional compensations is well documented on this board. We've had several issues come before us and I've been consistent in my opposition to them in favor of taking a look at the budget process, which we're in right now and we did meet, we did meet with you on Tuesday. So my hope is that we can address some of these issues in the budget process, which we have begun. Uh, so uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm being consistent here when I I feel as though going outside of uh, the, the process itself complicates things. I um, haven't always been successful in that, but uh, I, will re I will remain consistent. I appreciate that, Commissioner. Quick question. I know you mentioned in the briefing paper the, the lower salaries in comparison to Frederick and Baltimore. Just uh, roughly, how significant a difference is it between those two? those other two neighboring counties I'm just curious looking at the pay grades we're, we're that 6,000 is pretty pretty average okay um, at that pay level so we're looking at about a seven six to seven percent difference in pay pay rates um, according to of course longevity we've got the you know your pay grades you come in at the lower grade you start at the higher grade so as we turn staff over that changes the averages on both sides Okay. Um, and Baltimore County does have a union, so that adds sure. another piece to that whole puzzle of pay grades and benefits as well. And and we recognize that we don't expect that we're going to ever like match Baltimore County. It's one of the, you know, but we would like to at least be able to compete with them. And at the rates we're going right now, we don't even feel like we're in the same ballpark. No, I understand. I was just I was just kind of curious, uh -huh. just the general, how what the variance was between the two, just to see how how far apart that was. Um, Across all grades, it starts at seven percent and ends at thirty four percent, in terms of the under that our under pay over. brackets are. Okay, so most, seven to most 30. of them are in the seven to seven to eight percent. Yes. Okay. These these positions that we all hire a lot of the library associates and the circulation clerks. There's those are the people who really run the library. They're the ones you see at the desk. Those are the ones we we're looking at mostly for the, the this pay difference. Um, you know how it impacts them because we need we need them. No, absolutely, and I and I understand the challenges of you know you looking at your uh, staff retiring over the next few years. That's obviously a, an issue for a variety of people, and I'm not discounting it when I say that in reference to you. Um, obviously, support the library. Exploration Commons is amazing. If anybody hasn't seen it, please go check it out. I mean, I can't get into your classes, but that's okay. <laughs> you know, maybe one day we'll get a second one, Exploration Commons. Um, I'm going to have to echo my uh, my colleagues' opinions when it comes to the bu the uh, bonus situation. I I would much rather sit down and we try to figure out an area where we can find some 
commonality, I guess, in the budget as a whole. Um, I've not been a fan, as anybody knows, of the uh, the bonus situation. We've kind of set a precedent this year, which uh, I realize there's money sitting in an fun, unassigned fund balance, but I think the challenge becomes we've got huge lifting. That doesn't take away from you. That doesn't take away from your staff. And that's not me saying I think any less of any of you. I just think the concern when we're looking holistically at the whole process is what are the big, big issues coming down the pike? And that's not taking away from any of you. I think for me, I'd like to sit down and look at the budget and take a serious look at what you're asking for for next year and see what we can do to assist you in that process. So I've I have to echo the comments. I've been consistent at this point, but I do support you completely uh, outside of the uh, the idea of uh, bonuses. But thank you. Completely respect that, Commissioner. Thank you. The um, priorities that you laid in front of us last week with um, Eldersburg Library, with um, the 2.5 plus the 3, you know, um, <coughs> You know, you always say people first as a priority, but right now, what is the priority? I mean, I mean, you're, you're going to have to say, you know, with that laundry list, we're going to have to figure that out. You know, what, if anything, we can accomplish. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's all community driven. So, um, but that's going to be the hard look is, you know, what are those priorities and to me and the biggest challenge um is being community driven that's why you know i talk about safety and security and it's it's that grouping that we allowed um and you know continue the bonuses for the state's attorneys and the, and the courts because of that um not saying that this is less but that was what was what was my priority and that's what was driving me in in those in that decision so um yeah this is this is a tough one this is a really really tough ask so and and you know that i mean you know i, I know that well, i do in here so but i also know that that in the last three or four years my staff have mm -hmm. seen county employees get pay raises they have not gotten um, we we've kind of come back and say you all got five and a half percent why didn't we get why did we still get three percent we've seen bonuses that county employees have gotten that we've not gotten and my staff are beginning to wonder how important they really are in the eyes of the county and you all you all are, are very generous with your praise and you show up at the library events and and you know we're looking forward to seeing you all at Battle of the Books um, but the library here is we are as i said on monday we're starting to lose ground and we can't we can't keep the caliber of library we have we can't maintain that without the staff we have and so maintaining the staff keeping the staff being the desirable workplace being an employer of choice when it comes to the library industry is is important for our long-term health um, as a system i i want to leave this system whenever i do retire in much better shape than i found it and i found it in pretty good shape so that's quite a challenge i mean lynn, lynn left this library system in great shape mm -hmm. i want to make sure that that happens with on my watch um, and in order to do that i have to make sure that we can hire the best people um, and in order to hire the best people we must be competitive um, and that starts with the people that starts with the pay okay. rates and then it moves off to the, the buildings and the rest of it but the people really are the most important piece yeah. no it's very well said and uh, I agree with everything you just said um, and you are you know leaving it in continuing growing in better shape and that is going to be the legacy is not one thing but the continuation of excellence that our libraries have the um, flexibility that you have within your operational budget um, now knowing that there's not much there right now but as it grows you have that flexibility or we have the flexibility yes I'm I and, and I know Ted's in the room so he'll he'll make sure I don't misquote him oh he's not oh good then I can say it okay <laughs> he was here earlier so now you can misquote he was here earlier so if I misquote him it's, it's his out. own problem right um, no um, like many of the other 
county funded entities mm -hmm. the library has within its its budget um, the autonomy to decide how we allocate funds um, with one caveat and that is we can't actually create positions that have benefits unless we work with county HR because right. they're managed through yep. county HR and aside from that yes so if we decided and that our two big budget line items are people mm -hmm. and materials everything else falls away very dramatically from those two pieces the the materials we buy that means the books the um, movies the all of the physical things and the electronic things that we buy the databases and you know hoopla and overdrive and all that stuff that second that's our second largest pot of of expenses yeah. next to personnel personnel usually runs between 80 and 85 percent of our budget um, and then collections is another 10%, 8%, I know Jill's gonna correct 13. me. 13%, okay. Um, because people here love to read. Mm -hmm. So yes, we have autonomy within there, within that we can we can move hours back and forth for staff. We can decide we're gonna spend 12% on materials and move that 1% somewhere else. All of that pieces of our budget is, is internally driven. I apologize, but I, I forgot how much of the reserve was paying off exploration commons almost all of it which was how much five hundred and eleven thousand dollars five hundred eleven thousand dollars okay hmm. any other questions I do want to say thank you to the commissioners too for being willing to work with us on the budget going forward that Absolutely. that that really is a that's a huge lift I realize it I acknowledge the demands that you have on you as far as EMS and Maryland blueprint um, and that hence my comment on Monday that when you're talking about education don't forget the library's education um, we have to we have to maintain that level with this the community college and with the public schools or or we're not going to be able to do our jobs either yeah and that's daunting in front of us so I, I completely agree and I would not want to sit in your seats <laughs> no but you're gonna but, help it okay but I'm, but I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna make it easy either because I have to no. fight for my library staff absolutely and you should uh, totally you should. Yeah. you were you were gonna ask so, yeah I'll just uh, you know I'll explain myself a little bit here I um, you know I, I voted for the uh, the bonuses the comp compensatory bonuses for the state's attorney and for the circuit court uh, because I, you know, I looked at those as a matter of law and order, of putting away criminals of, of justice. Um, and I guess the, the difficulty that I'm having with this, and it's as a writer, it's not that I disagree that, that you know, librarians deserve better pay or those who work for libraries deserve better pay or anything like that. I, I guess the difficulty that I'm having is that you're requesting a one-time bonus that would increase salary that would not be commensurate with the salary going forward. So I... I you know, I would much rather have the discussion about improving a salary consistently going forward than I would about a one-time bonus saying, okay, well, you get $15 this year and you only get $10 next year. And, and so for me, that was the discussion that I also had with the state's attorney and the circuit, or the judges, that um, you know, they knew that they were, going, they, they were looking specifically for the 10% as a, a salary, uh, or d demonstrative of the salary pursuant to going forward. And they knew that they were going to have to fight to get that 10% again going forward. And so for me, um, you know, that, that's what it comes down to. I, I feel horrible about it. And I wish I could say, yes, I, I you know, have no problem saying, let's go ahead with the bonus. But, but at the end, I would much rather have the discussion about sustaining a salary for you going forward than I would about you know, one time. And maybe we'll see what happens next year. I want to make sure we're doing apples to apples, oranges to oranges when we're right. talking about bonuses and salaries. I think that's salaries, the same. Yeah. argument we're making like right it's, it's just we, that we're only we asking want, for five percent next year yeah, no. you know we're not trying to <clears throat> ask for something unreasonable if we came in and oh, asked no, I'm, for I'm not. 15 yeah, percent no, no as an increase in an operating budget that was impractical we knew that was impractical right. so when we make our request we try to not ask for more than we needed but what we needed so the bonus compared to what we asked for, I just don't, they're not really tied together because our bonus is to say, this is the 10% the county got. Yeah. And we think you are a valuable part of the county. It's, yeah, and it, I don't disagree. I just want to make sure, again, clarification. Ted, can you uh, 
Yeah, it just it sounds like maybe this got confused. I just wanted yeah. to say the board did approve bonuses for the circuit court and for the state's attorney. Right. So that part is no different than what we're talking about here. Right, but the argument that I was making with the state's attorney is that they knew going forward they were going to have to fight to get their salaries to a higher level. And that's what I'm coming down to. Because I think, and again, please do correct me if I misunderstood what you had said earlier, was that you, know, you were talking about these being one-time bonuses that were not connected to what you were going to be pursuing with salaries in the future. No, they are asking you for salary increases in the we, future. No, no, I know that, it's but a it's, a, it's a, right. I, I get that, but it's a different rate. They, they, the state attorney knew that they were going to have to be fighting for an elevated uh, uh, salary in the future, and and they were, to my understanding, and I could be mistaken. Their understanding was that that bonus was getting them to a place where they were consistent with the rest of the the county employees, and that going forward they were going to have to fight to keep that rate consistent. So. But yes. Yeah, so I, th I think, I'm getting it, is <clears throat> the ask from the state's attorneys and the circuit courts from the other day was 10% salary increase. That was on their request. Your ask from the other day is 2.5% above the 3.3%. Plus money for the merit pay. Right, and right. plus money, but you did not ask for 10% increase in your salary i can rewrite it if you want absolutely not <laughs> but i think that's the, yeah. the the confusing part is you you had two entities that are saying to stay consistent with the county they're asking for 10 percent continuation in increase in salary and you you're not you're We're saying not. you're saying 2.5 percent above the three above the th recommended three right. so this would just be a one-time bonus and not an ask for additional 10 percent no. so, so two things so, yeah. yeah all three entities have asked for the exact same thing with regard to bonuses one-time money right for one-time purpose that has no impact on their ongoing salaries they've also all asked as along with soil conservation for additional money in the FY24 budget to increase their salaries in an ongoing way different dollar amounts or percentages from each of those organizations. Two happened to be uh, the same at 10% and uh, soil conservation was different and, and yours is different. So there, so far there have been, right. at least to my recollection, four entities that are part of county funding uh, that are not your employees but part of county payroll and part of county right. funding that have asked for, um, for the, you're not part of the county payroll, but it, that have asked for salary increases. Right. Okay. Does that make does that make sense? And 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 I can see all that. Um, what complicates this a little bit, I think. Um, the state's attorney started talking about this in December. We're getting closer and closer. We're actually involved in the budget right now, and for me, it's very hard. And and unfortunately, you're you're more similar to the public schools. Um, eighty some percent of your budget is payroll related, so it's hard. The the the, the seventeen whatever's left, cut it in half, and you still can't do a lot to that. So I fully understand that, and it's a number of employees which makes this a, a big number. And and for me, it would be very hard to do this, and not have it in the back of my head when we're working on budget. I, I, I really think so. The timing of it, and 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 again, I think I was adamant early on. Um, I felt like law enforcement includes the judges and the state's attorney, and 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 it's a shame. Well, it's this whole situation is is a shame, and, and I don't want to go backwards, but um, I'm, I'm not sure we can fix every part of it, and um, so it it's a little different for me. The timing, the law enforcement part, makes this a little different, and and I think, uh, and I don't really have a. You guys asked great questions that I had, and I think you've <laughs> answered them well, and. Uh, but uh, I, I, I don't think I'm ready to do this today. I don't know, I don't know about the rest of you. And okay. Is there further questions? 
for discussion. Is there a motion? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's talk about purchase of in no. I won't talk. Yeah. Purchase of antennas and cradle points for sheriff's vehicles. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. The Office of Procurement in cooperation with the Carroll County Sheriff's Office is requesting your approval to award the purchase of vehicle equipment to include antennas and network management devices to Brooks Network Services LLC at a cost of $222,558. TD Synex was awarded a competitively bid contract by the National Cooperative Purchasing Alliance, which Brooks Network Services is an authorized dealer. This amount is approved within the 23 with the FY23 budget and no additional funds should be required. And I will turn it over to Vicki if you have any questions about the purchase. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. I'll just explain briefly for the briefing summary. Speak up a little sure. maybe it might be. There we go. Thank you. Oh, sure. So this is part of our ongoing body worn in car camera program as we move towards upfitting and retrofitting all of the vehicles that will be getting in car cameras. This equipment is <clears throat> designed to help upload, download video, connect mm. through to, to all of that because of the vast amount of data and video that we'll have to, to do that. So between the cradle points, which are network management devices that go in the cars and the antennas to handle that communication. So the funding I was able to actually obtain through a grant um, as part of this, there is funding out there that's available for all these body worn camera programs. So if you have any other questions. Love using grants other people's money <laughs> just uh, the only question I have is from from tail to teeth or teeth to tail do we know the actual cost when it comes to the, the overall system because it's a system of systems it is. you know and we well we're okay. still you'll see me again next week for more components so right. as we get through um, then yes we'd be able to come back and, and give you an overview of the entire project versus how it was all funded yeah. all the pieces how it works I know Sheriff DeWeese is looking to, to have vehicles for you to see okay. here in the spring so that you can see what all the equipment looks like in the cars yeah but we'll be able to actually pull that together we're we're still working through if you want to use an animation of an alligator use the teeth over here with the cameras <laughs> and then the tail over here with the analyst doing x yes. but there's a lot that there tail is. is much longer than the teeth and it, and, and of course it extends well beyond the sheriff's office into the yes. state's attorneys oh no no that that, that that's the tail yes. i'm not saying i'm not saying the state's attorney is a tail but the right. analyst and all, all of the transcription <laughs> the it services Absolutely. This and has been a year and a half project right. of making sure everything works. Um, sure. There's so and working with the courts. Yes. Um, yeah. There's so many pieces and yeah. the, everyone that's working on this project from our office has done a great job making sure working with IT, working with budget, yep. working with Maureen. Just it takes a lot. It's such an immense project and it has so many components to it absolutely and it's all for the right reasons i think it's um yes. good for us but it's also good for the community yes. to understand this is not just a camera on no. a vehicle or on a vest it, it is, is. But. so i appreciate that and i'm looking part, forward actually. it is and what's that the camera on the vest is probably the, the easy part part. relative no, to abso everything absolutely else. it's yeah. just every time it's another component it is it's a system of systems we just yeah. have to I don't doubt this whatsoever mm -hmm. and I don't think any of my colleagues will doubt this I think for the community to understand mm -hmm. a system of systems for safety and security of our community what this all entails and not necessarily just the cost but the, the component piece of this so um, and, okay. and even though um, it is many pieces and still some coming it was planned for in the budget Mm -hmm. and this is no additional funds Correct. Mm -hmm. i was actually able to obtain a grant to pay for all this equipment mm -hmm. great so okay 
Motion to approve the purchase of vehicle equipment to Brooks Network Services. I can't see LLC. The little punch holes in the way of the writing. <laughs> in the amount of $222,558. Second. I got a motion, I got a second. Any discussion? I know we uh please I know we often refer to grant money as as free, but it doesn't really feel free. It sounds like it's a lot of work and uh in my opinion, it almost feels like it's money that the, the state or the federal government sort of taken from us to begin with, and then we got to go through all this paperwork just to get some of it back. Uh, so, but with that said, I support the motion. Did you have a comment on that, or okay? No, I, that's just my. <laughs> no, comment. no, no, no. I was asking. Uh, no, I, I appreciate that. Any other comments, questions? Seen here, none. All in favor? Aye. aye. Did you say aye. Aye. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioners. No. Thank you. Okay, let's talk about the submission of FY24 Youth and Family Engagement Diversion. Application and acceptance of the award. Ms. Salim, Ms. Gabby. Good morning. Good to both of you. Good morning. morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Celine Steckel, Director of Citizen Services, and I'm joined here today uh, by Gabby Z Zelaya. She is our local management board <coughs> manager, and then we have Debbie Standiford from the grants office in the back as well. Um, we are here seeking approval to submit the FY24 Youth and Family Engagement Diversion Application and accept the award. Um, Carroll County is one of the jurisdictions in Maryland that has been selected to implement DJS's, the Department of Juvenile Services Behavioral Health Diversion Initiative. Um, and you may recall in 2018, this new initiative replaced the long-standing Adventure Diversion Program, which was partially funded by DJS for many years. The program is typically flat funded at $80,000 a year, but this year we are requesting $87,581 from DJS. Carroll County Local Management Board provides um, program and fiscal oversight of the Youth and Family Engagement Program, and we manage and monitor the contract with Carroll County Youth Services Bureau, who actually administers this program for Carroll County. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to Gabby to talk a little bit about the program. Thank you, Celine, and good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Uh, the Maryland Department of Juvenile Services is implementing a behavioral health diversion initiative throughout Maryland with the primary goal of linking youth with mental health needs and their families to community services, keeping youth in their homes, and diverting them from adjudication within the juvenile justice system. In line with DJS's behavioral health diversion initiative, the Carroll County Youth Service Bureau implements the Youth and Family Engagement Diversion Program, which provides behavioral health case management services for youth and their families who are at risk of or are currently involved with the Maryland Department of Juvenile Services. CCYSB staff assess the youth's and families' needs, create action plans, and facilitate linkages to community services identified during the referral and enrollment process. Participants also have access to CCYSB's continuum of behavioral health services to further support their success. This fiscal year 2024 state funding will continue operation of the program, which is staffed by a full-time bachelor level engagement manager and the supervising program director who was also a licensed clinical social worker. Here's a snapshot of some of the program's data and outcomes. From fiscal years 2019 to 2022, the program received an average of 38 referrals each year, and 18 have been received just in the first half of fiscal year 2023 alone. An average of 93% of the youth served by this program from fiscal years 2019 to 2022 achieved their goals outlined in their action plans, which included engaging in behavioral health and additional community support services. And currently, 88% of the youth served in the first half of fiscal year 2023 are achieving their goals within their action plans. Lastly, a key measure of this program's success is related to recidivism, or the percentage of youth who did not incur new juvenile delinquent charges for one year after completing the program. From fiscal years 2019 to 2022, an average of 90% of participating youth did not incur new charges after one year. Rates reported in the first half of fiscal year 2023 are similar. 95% of youth who were one year out from the program did not incur new charges. So I'm not sure if you had anything to add. Okay. Any uh, questions? Not a question, but a comment. I think the, <clears throat> the 90 or 95 percent rates impressive is all get out. I mean, that's that's incredible. It is. It truly is. I mean, I know I'm just repeating what you said, but I, I can't say enough how impressive that is. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to move that the Board of County Commissioners approve the submission of the FY24 Youth and Family Engagement Diversion Application and accept the award. Second. Okay, I got a motion. I got a second. Any further discussion? Seeing here none, all in favor? Aye. 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 
So, Gabby, this is your last day. When, when are you leaving? Uh, my last day with Carroll County Government will be April 6th. So okay. Next week. And you're still working on who's going to get you next? Well, yes. <laughs> a okay. little bit to be determined. So, okay. um, but appreciate my you know time here. Uh, it was a joy to, and a pleasure to meet you all before I, I do make my exit. So, thank you very you much. You as well. And good luck. Fantastic. God bless. Thank you Best very wishes, much. Yes. Okay, thanks. And, and I know I gave you a pin. Great so yes, great, I have it. Great presentation, <laughs> yes. Oh. You need a couple more pins. I do. No <laughs> <laughs> days yet, so. I appreciate that. Thank uh, you so much. But Gabby, what I can give you is a coin, so you can come up here and take oh that. Oh, my goodness. Thank That's you That's all I got. Much. I really appreciate it, it. it. After that, it's my glasses, so. Your gla oh, well, I don't want those. <laughs> thanks. And I will, I will say that um, well-deserved, because Gabby is really putting in a lot of effort as she is winding out of this role because there is a lot of work right now to do with the submission we just did um, with the NOFA application and, right. and a lot of loose ends so she's she's been a great support so thank that's you. awesome thank you very much thank you so much for all you've done for the community thank you. and now we're gonna have mr. Fowler who doesn't have a coin but that's okay <laughs> or a pin or a pin or a pin no thank you all thank absolutely you. thanks Gabby I don't have much of anything to offer, actually. No. Mm. <laughs> Nothing good. Well, that's because <laughs> Annapolis keeps taking it away from you. <laughs> good morning. Well, I, I didn't kill any trees, so I didn't give you a briefing paper, mostly because things are really kind of in the same posture they've been. You know, there are hearings going on, they're taking some votes, but the things we've been watching are still kind of static. Um, so the Senate did move their version of the cannabis bill forward. They obviously there are some differences between both bills. As it affects us, the taxes were approached differently by the Senate. So if you'll remember, the House version gave us one and a half percent of the six percent collected in Carroll County. The Senate moved that to five percent, but you have to share that with the municipalities. The municipalities do not get a five percent share. Um, the zoning remains the same. You still have those issues of uh, the, the terminology in there that's a little vague. So I don't think that's going to get addressed in conference committee. So that's, that's where the cannabis bill stands. Uh, the health guideline bill, that, that House version that, is, that we don't like, uh, was heard in the Senate committee yesterday. There were interesting. There were only four senators present because most of them were in other hearings presenting their bills in the House. But the there were no proponents other than the bill sponsor. But the opponents were the same. So Mabe was there, the Association of Superintendents, uh, the Superintendent of Anne Arundel, I believe and Prince George's superintendent all spoke in opposition. And we provide a joint letter with the Board of Education Correct. and the commissioners. Yes, and it was the same letter, essentially went to the delegation, just tweaked a little bit to be appropriate. Yeah, I just, again, I know it's you to us, but it's also to the community. It's um, House Bill 119 that went to the Senate, and it's uh, Senate Bill 199 that we're discussing about the framework the education right. framework that we the board of county commissioners along with the board of education agree that this is not a suitable bill to go forward therefore we signed a joint letter um last week maybe or two weeks mm -hmm. ago uh so yeah, two, just two weeks ago. yeah again the for the community because i really appreciate the work you're doing in getting our sentiment and intent into Annapolis. Um, I, it's been done before, but I think um, we're being more aggressive, and I like that. Uh, yes, you know, definitely. And, um, with Commissioner mm -hmm. Kyler and I getting down there uh, to try to be more aggressive and getting our views across, I think is also important. But um, yeah, and, and just on that particular note, the, the opposition the language was very strong that they used. It, it was much the same as your letter, that this is a usurpation of local control. Um, so I, I think it's pretty strong when you have the boards and the superintendents all opposing this. Uh, school bus camera uh, hearing was yesterday. So that 
bill was passed in the House and went over to the Senate. So the Senate hearing was yesterday. It was actually very contentious. Uh, the sponsor presented the bill exclusively about Montgomery County and how his main complaint seemed to be that the advocates of this have not done anything with the revenue to improve any safety situations. It, these citations are being issued, but there's no analysis or direction of funds to make some of these locations safer. But again, the, the discussion was all about Montgomery County. So you had in opposition, Mako was there, the Anne Arundel County Sheriff was there, and Bus Patrol was there. So this issue of the, the revenue from the cameras going into the general funds of the counties and, and again, not being used to improve on state roads was picked up by Senator Sidnor in Baltimore County, who is a real opponent of red light cameras, speed cameras, and the school bus cameras. He believes they are revenue generators exclusively. And the safety aspect is just an, an argument to support revenue. Uh, I thought the Anne Arundel County Sheriff was very effective in refuting that and talking about his program and, and the recidivism rate and that they've reached out to these communities, uh, non-speaking, uh, non-English speaking communities, for example, and communicated. Um, so it was, it was very contentious. I, I'm thinking if the bill passes, it, it will allow the cameras to remain in place, but it may direct the funds somewhere other than your general fund or, or mandate that they are applied in some you know, directed way. So we'll, we'll keep an eye on that. But I was a little shocked at, at how contentious that, that was. And of course, I don't have much empathy for the Montgomery <laughs> County people. Um, the fact that there aren't very many repeat violators, it's already making school bus stops way safer. And it's paying for the equipment, including, which we mentioned, I think, the cameras inside and, mm -hmm. and what we're right. getting out of it. And my concern is if this passes, if I'm the companies that furnish this stuff, I'd probably find another state to work in. And we're going to lose it. And I, I don't know. It, it sounds like there were others who were firm about that. I don't know if we want to be more firm than we even are, but I, I just... I, my, from the beginning, I thought Montgomery County had such a weak argument. I, I just think they, nicely put, they don't have a clue. But I don't know how we nicely say that. Yeah, it, I think because just because it's it's a state law, it's hard to make it a local only. Now, the Anne Arundel County Sheriff said that the discretion is up to law enforcement. They can issue warnings if they choose, which is not how I understood the law. Uh, so that perhaps the, the balance of the committee will not be in favor, but Senator Sidnor was so strident in his remarks, he may have some influence there. So I don't think you'll necessarily see that change, that the, the process of issuing the citations but I think you may see some, some direction now of the, of the revenue. So, if I remember correctly, the, we're running the program in Carroll at a deficit. Yes. yes, so that's what I was gonna say. I, I double check with budget, but I don't believe the count, Carroll County receives any general fund revenue from it no. because it's all going to pay for, yeah. and we're, right. as you said, in deficit. Yeah. And, and, and we had that briefing, which was good. It's timely that we did have it. The sheriff was mm -hmm. in here, and that's, that's what he explained to us. Essentially, we've got to reach a particular threshold mm -hmm. in order to act, uh, re, uh, reap any of these uh, funds, but we probably won't get there. So for us in Carroll County, like Commissioner Kyler mentioned, it's all about compliance and things like mm -hmm. that. What I find amusing though is that Annapolis may find a way to get involved with this and tell us how to spend the money if we ever got it 
but yeah, well, that's par for the course, I guess. So well, we'll see yeah, what well, happens. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of hopeful that I, I thought again the Anne Arundel Sheriff, um, he really put his program in a really strong light, and he refuted, I think, a lot of the claims that were being made. So sounds like there's a real struggle in Montgomery County between. You know, law enforcement, the delegation, oh, it is. and and the school boards. Right, that's kind of where the problem lies. They, so they also had a bill to be more tough on police. I don't know where that if that died early or that's still going on, but I, I just felt like those two bills were so contradictory. Yeah, the qualified immunity bill is, is still in play. Yes. The authority dissolution bill, uh, the, the vote in the Senate committee was held over. But I had a discussion, a uh, brief discussion with the bill sponsor. And when, when that bill came out, I, I had suspicions that there were uh, uh, sort of political issues underlying that. I don't believe that now. Um, it, it appears to me that it is a result of that Star Commission recommendation. Um, when you read the bill now, there actually is the ability for the authority to remain in its current Sorry. state. Um, so it really depends on what that DLS analysis comes back with, and that comes back, I believe, December 1st of this year. So we'll know going into the next session what the proposal is going to be to do that. But one of the conditions in there is bringing back enough information to the committee or to the General Assembly in a larger sense uh, to enable them to make the decision if the authority should continue. So still not, I said it was a fait accompli. I don't believe it's a fait accompli. The, uh, the taking away of the ability of the authority to issue bonds um, in, in his words were really so that someone couldn't issue a bond in an attempt to try to keep the authority alive as it were so um, I, I've changed my mind a little bit on that I'm not sure my my friend in solid waste is a little more skeptical he's got a little more experience with this so and uh, and then the governor's bill package is uh, was heard in, in House committees yesterday. So that's his service program, uh, the veterans tax exemption, the expansion of the child tax credit, and the acceleration of the minimum wage. So some of that got whittled down, as we talked about before. For example, in the, uh, in the minimum wage bill, they took out the indexing. So, and of course, the big elephant in the room is the budget that has to be passed by Monday. And that's uh, come, That's in committee. Uh, excuse me, in conference committee now. So they're working through their differences. And the big differences, I think, are um, in the blueprint. You know, Baltimore City. That that changing of uh, or, or adding uh, or, or changing the way poverty is is calculated with the free and reduced meals. Or kind of threw a wrench into things this year. And uh, the way they they're doing it now. Baltimore, uh, Baltimore City, their funding gets a little screwed up. Uh, so there's some work in the budget now to try to make them whole. And I think there's a bill that changes some of that to make them whole. So, uh, so how that the the budget will accommodate the blueprint is sort of still in flux. And of course, again, our capital projects didn't make the cut. So. Um, it doesn't appear Carroll County will get any grant money. That's that's correct. Grant money as far as what the bond for bills? Our for capital? Fire no, 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 no. Capital projects. Grounds. We're not going to get any capital project money. Right. We're not alone in that. Mm. A lot of capital like projects that, were. That was part <laughs> of this cut. bigger funding for Blueprint. I think, unfortunately, well, fortunately, Annapolis sees that in three years this could bankrupt them. And you do, even though they have a pot of money now for it, so they're adding for the future, but right. they're taking away. Yeah, they're, we're gotta watch it. We're we're not getting treated fairly. How's that? That's uh, right. Right. Yes, I think there was at least a billion dollars worth of bond initiatives that were put forward by the legislature. Right. And 
and many of those were in last year's and got taken out and or they were proposed for last year yeah yeah, yeah. right right but yes. um yes so yes. so specifically the Hampstead right. Right. Volunteer fire department yes right. yes so we're not getting any okay well the ones that the ones that were proposed by Senator Reedy right and the delegation Right. So right. the ones you heard at yeah. their their hearing, yeah, yes, no, none of those are going forward. Okay. Um, and do all those that know that they put them forward are not getting? I couldn't tell you that. Neither could I. So I think. Yeah, um, I think they're probably in touch with Senator Reedy's office. Yeah. I think uh, if we can get a list of those that had been put forward and are not getting funded um, would be good. So I can do that. we have the opportunity to talk to the community about that um, because I don't think, I mean, I know I don't like it <laughs> and I don't think my colleagues like it, you know. Um, I don't think but, the delegation likes it. <clears throat> so it's um, their, their, their proposals, right? right? So, so yeah. I think. And including um, Senator West, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He yeah, also absolutely. lost. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, I think um, if you can do a little bit of due diligence mm -hmm. getting that for us, that listing, I think, would be, uh, would be helpful. Sure. So, thanks. That's not good news. Give me some good news. I wish I could. <laughs> it's almost over. It's almost over, yes. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I was going to say, we... Uh, Signy so, dies. Uh, yeah, Signy dies the 10th. So yeah. there's going to be a lot happening next week. Um, and our delegation and a lot of the people in your network I don't want to take anything away from them they fight they fight a hard battle down mm -hmm. there but um, some of the stuff you hear I, I told one of them last night I very much enjoy my drive back to Carroll County <laughs> it is the, it is the truth I mean it's all of a sudden you just feel I don't say cleaner but just feel like <laughs> freer you know from some of the restraints and uh that's why i like who we are i mean honestly but um yeah if you can get us that list um sure. also just let you know commissioner kyler and i will be down on wednesday um to meet up with um secretary woods mm -hmm. tony woods um so deputy secretary finn and i are kind of doing the coordination right now but and i think uh Delegate Tomlinson wanted to also join us. Oh, good. So um, we'll make sure we reach out to him as well. But uh, give us an opportunity to, <coughs> you know, have a conversation with the secretary. So, and just let everybody, secretary is, uh, secretary of the Veterans Affairs in Maryland. So, okay. Cool. What else? Afraid that's all I have for you. I think we'll be killing some trees next week, though. <laughs> yeah. A lot going on. Okay. Any uh, questions? Thanks for always faithfully attending to things and reporting back to us and keeping us informed about what's going on. I appreciate that. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Thanks. Um, now we're going to talk about Westminster Annexation Number 75, Stone Chapel, LLC. Um, Chris, do we have anybody on the line? No, sir. Okay. Do we have any public yes, comment? Oh. oh, we do have public <laughs> comment. Here, the com comment card. You spoke too soon. I know. <laughs> did. So, let's start with public comment. First off, we saw your your son, and he's adorable, and your your the grandma was very happy. Thank but you. I'm glad he wasn't too so interruptive. When I saw that on the calendar, I was like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> he was very well behaved. I'm hoping you are, too. So. Well, thank you. Thank okay. you. I'll try. Um, <laughs> good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Kelly Schaefer Miller, 73 East Main Street, Westminster, Maryland, 21157. I am here this morning on behalf of um, the petitioner for the annexation. Mr. Scott Hare is the owner of the property. He's seated over here. And I also have with me John Kraft from Kimley Horn, who prepared the 
annexation plat. So we've been speaking with Linda and Hannah through this process, um, appreciate the county review of this annexation. We also have all of the city of Westminster staff, Mr. Mark Depot, Andrea Gerhardt, and Leanne, I'm sorry, I don't know your last name. Champney. Champney with us as well, um, mainly just to answer any questions that you have about this petition. You're, I'm, I know you're about to get the staff report, so you might not have any until you hear um, the, the, the staff's presentation on this. But this is a request for an annexation of a property. It's an industrially zoned property that is um, on off of Maryland 31. Um, it is directly across R Route 31 from the um, wastewater treatment plant sorry in the city so um we're here to answer any qu any specific questions that you might have but i'm sure a lot of those questions will probably be answered in staff's presentation as well okay thank you now you thank put you. the clock up i see how it <laughs> <laughs> wow I, think I was still under that yeah, anyway. that was that was great for 10 seconds that was, uh, <laughs> yeah. that was pretty impressive for uh 10 seconds yeah okay Ms. Linda, Ms. Hannah. All right. Good Show morning, commissioners. Good morning. Um, as Ms. Schaefer said, we are here to um, present to you the annexation for Stone Chapel. But before we do that, this is the first annexation this body has seen come before them, um, the first of many to come. Um, so we're going to go ahead and just give you a little bit of background on the process itself and then the annexation petition at hand for you this morning. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Hannah Weber, our comprehensive planner. Good morning, everybody. Um, first, going over annexation processes, what they are, the county's role in it, um, et cetera. So what are municipal annexations? It is the process of legally including within the corporate limits of a city or town an unincorporated area that is outside of the municipality. An annexed area must be inside the municipality's growth area in their most recent comprehensive plan. It must be contiguous and adjoining to the existing corporate limit boundaries, and it cannot create an enclave, which is an unincorporated area bounded on all sides. So looking at this past example of a Union Bridge annexation, the annexation area is shown in blue. You can see we are adjoining the previous corporate limits of Union Bridge. You can see this gold and black boundary shows that we are inside the municipal growth area. And you can see that there is no unincorporated space, so we were not creating an enclave in this annexation. So what is the county's process? An annexation packet is sent to the county by a municipality. It is usually sent um, directly to the Department of Planning or to the commissioner's office. It is then um, transmitted to county agencies by the Department of Planning. A staff report is prepared by planning staff and presented to the um, Planning Commission. A recommendation is given by the Planning Commission and forwarded to you all, the county commissioners. And then the Board of County Commissioner approve or denies a zoning waiver if it's applicable and forwards a comment letter to the municipality prior to the public hearing. So with that, if you can go to the previous slide, Hannah. So I just want to make note that um, the municipal growth area itself is already the agreed upon ultimate annexable area by that municipality. So when there's not a zoning waiver involved, and Hannah will get to that, the Board of County Commissioner's role is just to forward comment information because through the planning process, this municipal growth area is already a mutually agreed upon boundary for that ultimate annexable area of, of the corporate limit. So the county's agreed to it and the municipality has agreed to it. If there's an issue between that municipal growth area boundary, we would actually have some discussions and that would go to um, uh, Maryland Department of Planning for um, arbitration. So the whole point is, is that when they adopted the plan, you know, they know, we all know that this is in their future goals to accept the, these properties into their town boundary essentially. And just going into a little bit about what a comment letter is, as Linda briefly touched on, it's basically just outlining um, any county um, worries or comments that we received and forwarding it to the municipality prior to the public hearing so they have it all on record. So going into a zoning waiver, it's not always required for annexations. But if the proposed municipal zoning is substantially different in use or has a development density of greater than 50% than the original county zoning, the Board of County Commissioners may approve a zoning waiver. 
a zoning waiver is included in the annexation packet and it must be requested by the town and the petitioners. Without the approval of a zoning waiver by the county commissioners, no rezoning can occur on the annexed property for five years. And I've just given some examples of past annexations where zoning waivers were required. We have on the left the Tawny Town annexation of the Sewell property. The original county zoning was agriculture and the requested zoning was R10,000. So because we were going from agriculture to R10,000, which is substantially different in use, a zoning waiver had to be required. On the right hand side, we have the Mount Airy annexation of the full property. The original county zoning was R40,000 and the requested zoning was R2. So we were going from one lot, um, one lot per acre to two lots per acre, which is substantially different in density, which necessitated, necessitated a zoning waiver. So that's it just for the high level stuff and we're gonna go ahead and jump into the actual annexation unless there's any questions. Are there any questions, because this can get complicated if you've not seen it before on, okay, at least for me, it was complicated. <laughs> so, okay, thanks. So we have Westminster Annexation number 75, Stone Chapel, LLC. Here is the annexation plat that was submitted to the county. As Kelly briefly touched on, we are along Stone Chapel Road, Avondale Road, and um, Maryland 31. The annexation area is approximately 75 acres. You can see the corporate limits of Westminster to the north. Here you can see we are in the southeastern quadrant of the Westminster area. You can see in this map the gold and um, black border shows this property is inside the city of Westminster's growth area. And again, the corporate limits to the north show that we will not create an enclave when this is annexed. As stated previously, this annexation is approximately 75.97 acres. It is improved with small residential and agricultural buildings, and it is actively being farmed. The county zoning currently is I-2 industrial heavy. The petitioners have requested to be put into IR industrial restricted in the city of Westminster. So because the two zoning districts are similar in their industrial uses allowed, there is no zoning waiver required. The designated land use is industrial taken from the 2007 Westminster Environs Community Comprehensive Plan. For infrastructure, we are in the priority water and the existing sewer service areas. This annexation um, area recently went under a um, 2020 <coughs> spring amendment to bring this annexation area into the served areas. We have received some um, comments from county agencies. The Bureau of Development Review is recommending um, annexation of the entire property or subdividing the property at the line of the zoning split to create an independent parcel in the county's conservation district. So I'm just gonna touch on that comment really quickly. So um, the Bureau of Development Review is recommending, the property line actually extends all the way to Stone Chapel Road. But because this area is not inside the municipal growth area, it cannot be annexed into the city of Westminster. So they are recommending subdividing at this zoning line split to it'll um, just make it easier down the line when development comes, um, just with setbacks between the city and the county. So that is their recommendation. And then we also received a comment from the Department of Public Works. Carroll County owns a 50-foot right-of-way along Stone Chapel Road and a 40-foot right-of-way along Avondale Road adjacent to the 66-foot right-of-way um, for the railroad. The Department of Public Works does not support the request because it would cause the loss of the right-of-way that the county owns and needs to maintain. The Department of Planning recommends the City of Westminster give public notice by posting the property prior to the date of the public hearing and notifying all adjoining property owners of the date of the public hearing. And I'm not sure if Kelly wants to touch on the um, Public Works comment. If I'd you love to. If I yeah. Thank you. I think it's a little bit more relevant that I touch on this now than I did at the introduction. So, um, as Hannah just noted there were two um, kind of substantive comments, one from development review um, about a potential subdivision line. So it's my understanding, and I've, I've spoken with city staff as well about this, that 
if and when a subdivision and or site plan come forward at the city level, that sort of comment would be carried forward during that review process. We understand that um, this property will be in two jurisdictions. Uh, it is already split zoned, so this is not creating a, a situation where a property is split zoned. Um, happy to answer any additional questions on that that this board may have. And then related to the public works comment, there's no, uh, I think there's just a little bit of misunderstanding. There's no loss of right of way as a result of the annexation. The county still has those roads, those right of ways, the Avondale and Stone Chapel. Um, we, I, I believe Mr. Depo, and he can speak for himself, but has spoken with uh, Department of Public Works, and I will as well, in coming to some kind of maintenance agreement, because that one portion of Avondale that you can see does um, kind of bisect the property and is part of the annexed area. So because that's still entirely surrounded by county property, um, and an annexation, just also to go into that, doesn't... Um, the property owner still pays the same county taxes. If and when he gets annexed, he will then also pay municipal taxes. So at this point in time, because of this situation, we would suggest that it's appropriate for the count county to continue maintenance of that one section of Avondale. Um, but as you saw the annexable area, there could come a point in time where these surrounding properties get annexed and then that would be revisited, of course. Um, but that can all be worked out through some kind of agreement and that'll be a discussion with city and county and everybody through the remainder of this process. Um, this, as Hannah introduced this, will, after going through your review, this then will go through a public hearing at the mayor and council for the city of Westminster. But if you have any specific questions, please don't hesitate yes, to yes. ask. How will it be documented? So if this gets annexed, there is a right-of-way, but Westminster will control the review of plans and what the developer does. How are we assured that, certainly with industrial, the road will have to be improved, how, how are we assured that Westminster will make sure that cost is all on the developer, not any of it on the county? Well, I... I'm not going to speak for for the city's development review process, but they have a development review and a site plan process akin to the county's, and so that agency would comment I'll and be a part that. of that process, and so any of that would be addressed through a site plan process. So, so the comments through the site plan process would take care of that documentation? Yes. Why do we want to annex this? Why, it, why does the property owner want this being annexed? The, the property owner wants this to be annexed because, just to go back quickly in history, um, this property initially had a portion of it that was in the water and sewer service area and a portion that was out. So they were in a situation where they could not develop on public facilities, but they also could not develop on private facilities. And so we had meetings with the city of Westminster, and it, it ultimately came to the decision of, do we want to request for the whole area to be in, or do we want to request the whole area to be out? And the decision decision was made that to develop an industrial um, potential subdivision on in this area would be best served by public facilities. And so the map amendment process was gone through to amend the water and sewer maps to include this entire portion of the industrial portion of this property, um, which then allowed for this property to um, petition to annex in, into the city. The city's current policy, again, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong about this, Mark or Andrea, is that we would not have the access access to public facilities if we did not annex. Right. So that's the impetus for this request. Okay. So you mean public facilities as in public water and sewer? Yes, okay. correct. So the, the Carroll County, my concern here is that Carroll County Public Works is, stay, is telling us that they will lose right away. And that contradicts what, what you just said. And as Commissioner Rossi mentioned earlier, these things are complicated. And I haven't been around long, but I've been around long enough to know that decisions we make now do affect us later on, and sometimes they cost us money, <laughs> the county, that is, which is not my money. It's everyone else's money. So I, I really need to get more information on this before I, I think I can make a decision unless somebody can clear it up real quick. And uh, I don't think we're, I mean, we're not under some urgent time uh, uh, I have time reserved for next week. Um, I have time reserved for next Thursday. Okay. 
to come back if we're not ready for a decision today? Just, just my just my thoughts. I know I need to have some consensus up here uh, as well. So, well, Commissioner Gary, and I agree. That was one of the things that was outstanding to me as well, that the Department of Public Works had some concerns. And I know you'd mentioned something about a maintenance agreement. or So I would like more information about that before proceeding. I mean, I, apart from that, I really don't have any concerns about this. I just want to make sure that the county's interest in this is, is honored and maintained. There's been references to a 50-foot right-of-way county. Is that a deeded right-of-way? You know the Does the county own that in fee? I mean, I, I guess that's... I believe it is a county-owned right-of-way. Uh, so if we're losing right-of-way, there's going to have to be some accommodations right. with the county. I mean, we don't. they can't just take it if it's deeded to the county. Well, and Mr. Burke, to that point, and jump in if you think I'm incorrect, um, an annexation does not inherently mean that that, that deed transfers to the city. No, that, that's... Um, so, that, so that's where the slight misunderstanding about the loss of right-of-way is. There's no... This does not trigger a loss of any county right-of-way. I think that was just... I think the maintenance issue is really what the Department of Public Works was kind of hammering down on, and then it just got a little bit lost in translation there. Yeah, I think um, that loss in translation just needs to be um, some clarity to it for us for next week, yep. um, specifically on that. Um, and yeah, uh, <clears throat> I mean, I, I'm definitely comfortable with information at this point. Mm -hmm. And uh, like my colleagues, I think getting some clarity uh, would help so yeah I've been trying now but I don't know if anyone no no and that's okay I mean there, okay. there's we, we have time next week too yeah. to we, we, we have it on schedule so we're, we're good we don't need to you know and one more process. question if I understand this right um, so if this were annexed in obviously Westminster has agreed they will get water and sewer um, if this were outside um, and I remember, I think, um, maybe Friendship Valley School, Westminster could serve water to property in the county, but that comes, that permission is a little harder to get. So that requires a good cause waiver. Say again. A good cause waiver from the person requesting um, to have those services extended. And I think Mark could probably elaborate more that the, ca the city has changed its allocation policy for both water and sewer outside of corporate limits. So those, um, I don't think, are really being issued as they once were. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. say again. They They're not be being as issued as they once were. Exactly. Yeah. Because we do have a lot of land that's in the county that is on un un city water and sewer. They have not been annexed and, in. So. And I respect that the city of Westminster wants them mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. inside the city to, to do that furnishing it's so uh, unfortunately they don't have unlimited water <laughs> well yeah okay um does the city of westminster have any comments that you'd like to make <clears throat> uh thank you and good morning uh for the record mark depot the director of community planning and development for the city of westminster 45 West Main Street, Westminster, Maryland, 21157. Um, I concur with what was stated. The annexation does not take ownership. We will not take any ownership of right of way. It stays under the ownership of Carroll County, and that is not changing. The maintenance of it as well, if it is owned by Carroll County, it's maintained by Carroll County. And if we need to enter into an agreement with Carroll County Department of Public Works, we're happy to do that demonstrate that we're not taking over that right of way and we're not maintaining it uh, and I did reach out to Mr. Bowers about this and I, again I concur with his statement that the county maintains maintenance um, I would assume over time as more gets annexed and we do get the full roadway that's where we may look at some concept of maintenance but ownership we are not taking any ownership from this annexation does not do that as far as water the policy is if you are eligible for annexation and you're inside the growth boundary and um, you want water, public water and sewer, you have to annex into the city as part of the policy. If you're not eligible for annexation, being that you're not adjacent to and you're not creating an enclave, you can request a good cause waiver 
and you still write, you still have to sign a letter basically stating that at such time you are eligible, you shall annex into the city. So at some point, um, annexation is always the end result. Okay. No, very clear. I, I appreciate it. And I think, uh, again, just get continuation. Thank you. Um, Thank you. A little bit of uh, clarity for next week, and we can make a decision. Yeah. Cool. Please. Okay. Is that good with yep. everybody? Absolutely. Yes, sir. Cool. Sounds good. Okay, let's move on to. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move on to payout of annual leave balances in excess of 60 days for fiscal year ending <coughs> June 30th, 2023. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Morning. So I bring before you today a proposal to use one-time funding in the Human Resources budget for payment of annual leave hours in excess of 60 days to eligible employees. So as the briefing paper described, prior to 2022, the maximum accumulation for annual leave days to be carried over from one fiscal year to the next was 45 days. During the pandemic, the maximum was suspended. So employees were allowed to accrue over that 45 days and carry that from one year into the next. In July of 2022, chapter 36 was revised to put in a limit of 60 days. And that is the limit that we're now following and the limit that employees would be subject to as of the end of this fiscal year, moving into fiscal year 24. If employees don't use that annual leave time, they simply lose it. So we have employees that are making a lot of attempts to use up their time so they don't lose it. Um, that is affecting some of the projects and things that we're working on. So um, as of March 10th, there were approximately 86 employees that had over the 60 days in their annual leave balance. And the average years of service for those individuals were 22 years of service. So it is more of our longtime employees that have accrued those large balances. So for 2023 only, I propose that those employees be paid out their annual leave balances in excess of 60 days at 50% of their pay rate. So it is not at 100%. And that we would use the one-time funding in the human resources budget of which there's approximately $500,000 remaining. And that's where Ted would come in on any questions on that, on that budget. Um, I appreciate him being here to support me. Well, a question on, on the leave itself. So let's say I have 26 extra days and I try, wanna try to use it. There are justifications why that can be denied. Correct. correct? Yes. So, so I may want to use it, but told I cannot. That's correct. Obviously, a morale issue. At oh yes, I know. That but point. yeah, and, and, and in my world, it was like in construction in mm -hmm. June, July, we'd never yeah. let anybody take off. Right. You know, and we right. but we had rules saying you know whatever you get four weeks vacation, mm -hmm. you can use one week between July first and. Mm -hmm. September yeah. because we also had which I'm sure you guys deal with uh, spouse spouses that had you know they wanted to go to Disney World in June yeah. <laughs> and the kids are out of school right yeah <laughs> okay. any other questions this is a one-time deal one time when do you believe if you had your crystal ball the next time would be I would suspect not anytime soon because we will reduce everyone to 60 days it will be very clear that that is the limit and i hope we are hope i know is not a course of action but i do hope we are never in a pandemic again <laughs> that i think has driven a lot of this situation where where the people were not taking time off yeah. um you know we were doing a lot of work from home telework sure. and uh that that leave time was accruing unlimited and you know just um from my personal experience uh the pandemic was the wars that caused us not to have the ability to take leave and um it was a significant morale issue and it was i mean when i retired i think i had four months of built-up leave and which is more than twice or three times I mean, it, it was silly to a point um and it's not because i didn't want to take it it's just i was unable to um so right-sizing the ship is important. Um, and 
getting people back into you know the the uh, the, the process of taking leave mm-hmm. uh, appropriately and taking care of themselves and their families and you know uh, becoming more efficient is very important so if you think this is uh, a method of doing that <laughs> you know I I like it um, 50% is just between zero and a hundred or is it the numbers I mean as far as the cost well I, I see the cost but um, why not 75 percent why aren't you asking for 75 percent and bringing us down to 50 or and and piggybacking versa? that yeah the justification for 50 percent and um hr never pleases everyone <laughs> um what kind of kickback do you think you'll get because because I, I i agree that's a good question yeah so as far as kickback i, I don't think we'll have much um, I do think that the employees that are working on projects and things like that are dedicated to those projects and I think have reserved themselves that they're going to lose time. So I think they would appreciate this um, as, as you know, a, a course of action from the county. Um, 50% was just, you know, a reasonable cost. It was 164000 out of that, that, those funds that were left. Um, you know, 75%, I, I think 50 puts a little bit of ownership on the employee and then, you know, makes the, the county kick in the, the 50% and splitting it half ways is, you know, better than nothing, better than losing it. And what employees does this cover? I know you mentioned that there are 86 employees. I mean, what, is it across all departments? It is. is. It, it's across all departments and governmental partners. Oh, that, that, so that was my next question. Yep. Everyone on county payroll. Yep. is. Everyone on county payroll. Right. Yes. So there's no confusion, questions. We're not going to have folks coming in here saying, what about me? Right. Well, unless they're not on county payroll. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but that includes the circuit court, the state's attorney, uh, the uh, soil conservation. Yep. And the sheriff. And the sheriff. The sheriff. You know okay. that's not a simple discussion. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you know, call it what it is. That's the elephant no, in the room in many of our clear. conversations. Um, You have how much uh, in your budget right now? We have about half a million in one-time funding. That was set aside for compensation and classification issues. Um, you know, there, there's various opportunities for us to look at other things, which we're doing. Um, it's just a matter of when, when do they become implemented that could take up some of those funds. Okay, well, I'm going to make the motion that the Board of County Commissioners approve the use of one-time funding in the human resources budget for payment to eligible employees of all annual leave hours in excess of 60 days at the rate of 75% of base hourly pay. Eligible employees will be those with an annual leave balance in excess of 60 days as of the last pay period in June 2023. You said the average workforce with 60 plus days is 20 plus years in service. 22, yes. 22 years in service. Yeah, that's a long time to serve our community. And that's why, you know, I believe giving more than less is appropriate because if it's if the average was six years or seven, that's a different story. But um, that, that's my rationale. Uh, so, And it's already in the budget. It is funding that is available in our budget, yes. Right. Second. So, okay, sorry. Oh, no, no, go ahead. I was going to wait for the second, and then I, had, oh. I have a comment, yeah, okay. question. I or apologize. Question, comment. No, we okay, got a motion, got a second. Discussion. So, I mean, I empathize with these employees, and... I mean, we all lived through the same pandemic. Some people got to work. Some people were sent home. Mm-hmm. Some people didn't live through it. Some people couldn't go to work. Some people could. Some people lost businesses. Some people were fired for not getting the shot, so on and so forth. We could go on and do that all day long. Uh, in my firmer line of work, we called it use or lose. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes mm-hmm. if you didn't use or leave, you, you, you lost it. Um, so I think for county residents that are watching that were adversely affected by the pandemic and we always and we all were um, I think 
what I would want to ask is if there are any other alternatives that we looked at prior to expending this money. Do we have a leave bank at the county where people can donate leave? Can we possibly extend the usage of leave through Labor Day so people might have the opportunity to use this extra leave through the summer? Because I'm, I'm not I'm not in full support. So we do not have a, a leave bank donation. Um, part of the reason for that is we have short-term disability benefits and long-term disability benefits that are in place for our employees. So we do have the opportunity if employees need um, supplemental income because they're out due to their own illness or, or injury that they do receive payment from the county. There's a seven calendar day waiting period and then they receive, I believe it's 70% of their wages. So. Um, you know that kind of offsets the need for a bank for donation for individuals that are going through those those conditions um, as far as as extending the time frame um, you know it rolls from one fiscal year then into the next and certainly Ted can speak to that if, if need be but we want to this funding is in fiscal year 23 so if we carry that over it does um, work on our books um, and it does need to be carried over I believe on the comptroller's books um, with regards to funding in the into the next year okay. now that you know, yeah, that's a perfect response that makes a lot of sense and I commend you for looking at this I mean okay. I miss Bissler this is this is what a good HR person does okay. they're, they're trying to look out for the, all the employees and I appreciate the fact that you came in with a, a compromise of sorts mm -hmm. you're not asking for the entire amount so for that I'm very appreciative thank you I think um, no I I like the comments and I like to comment question about the leave bank and explain the disability benefits I think um, what, again, took me over the top on this was the 22 years of service that, um, you know, uh, yeah, and, and that, that, that's where I got caught up. Um, I'm sure there's some that are less out of that 86, but I'm sure that there's some that are more, but if the average is 22, then that's what got me there, so. but great comments um okay are there any other comments or discussion yeah yeah yes. and similar to uh commissioner karen's comments made me more comfortable with the 50 percent than then making a 75 but also are we setting any bad precedents with this like you you just said uh disability 70 percent i don't know if you have a buyout for vac unused sick days or whatever do you have anything that whether this is 50 or 75 percent you're uncomfortable with with setting any precedent i'm not uncomfortable with either percentage um i i don't think we're setting a precedent i think this is a, a one time and explained as that and mm -hmm. you know the communication will be very clear to the staff that this is a one time and you know it's it's based on the the I, you know things that went on in the world for the past three years and and uh, we certainly want to take that into account and and the the 60 day limit is in effect for next year and plan your time accordingly I think it's important for everybody to take that time off um, and, and be more responsible about that and and use it throughout the year so. okay I think there are valid points by both Commissioner Guerin and Commissioner Kyler I guess to to the point of it being the 75 versus the 50 I have a little a little less of a issue with the 50 now than with the 75 I do to Commissioner Guerin's point though we obviously all went through this and that's not taken away from anybody that and to his point there were people that lost jobs and businesses and I do agree with that um, I obviously the glaring number here is Commissioner Rothstein has mentioned the 22 years in service um, and I realize we're trying to clean up the book so to speak um, and I appreciate all the hard work you've done putting this together. I guess my only concern would be there's no really great way to fix this. I mean, there is. We just pay them out, but that's the people's money. It's not my money. It's not our money. And I also appreciate the hard service put in by everyone that are owed these days. I guess my only point would be what would be the issue if we were, and I realize one-time situation, that's what we're talking about because it's COVID. Um, what would be the issue just to do it one time and allow them to have those extended days for a limited window versus the payout? Because yes, they weren't able to take those days, whether they were working from home or whatever else. 
And I realize that's not typical policy, but it wasn't a typical time. Mm -hmm. So to me, I would be a little more comfortable if we would give them just a brief window to, to burn off those additional days. And I understand there's major projects going on. I've been in that situation and jobs before, but I wasn't dealing with a pandemic. Um, is there any really issue, major issues, Ted, if we were to allow that for a brief window? I realize there's a carryover to the next year, budget-wise. Uh, not, it's not a budget issue now. Okay. The, I think, as, as Christy said, the issue is all sort of kicking that can down mm -hmm. the road a little bit because people are constantly accruing annual leave, and so by allowing, and, and that's a little bit of how we are in this situation. People just couldn't take you know, they couldn't go anywhere <laughs> for many years. So, um, you know, as a result, they accumulated this leave. So, we're, yeah, so. Well, I just, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I, that you, when you say kicking the, the can down the road, one of the things I really like about this, whether we're 50 or 75, is the one time, and it gives you the opportunity to say, we're doing this, but this is it. You better use it. And if we extend, I don't know if we're, sending the message like oh you know maybe it is okay if you could and it, you don't as use. the briefing paper stated it had been extended several times by the pandemic policy that that carroll county had in place at that time so it's it's been kind of kicked down the road for for some time now where the um limits were completely um overlooked for a good two years i believe was the oh. time frame on that and, and to your point, I, I understand that. I was reading on the briefing paper. But I also think people were still kind of struggling with what's normal for whatever that is at that time. I mean, I would I would be comfortable just giving them uh, – I know we've done it before on some, some issues here. I'd like to give them one more opportunity and then basically burn it out entirely versus just us spending this money at this point. It's not that I'm against anyone that's worked for 22 years. I think it's admirable and then some. I just think give them the option and let them know it's, it's this or nothing at this point. Let them, let them use it. Just, um, I, I apologize, Jenny. I know you want to say something. Just give me a couple minutes. Um, I understand, and like uh, Commissioner Garen was saying, the, the user lose. Um, and the dilemma that I was in with those four, five months, whatever it was, <clears throat> I was able to use it as terminal leave when I left, took the uniform off. By doing that, I was actually getting 100% of my salary. In leave because I wasn't working but I was still getting a hundred percent you know so by doing a payout you're actually giving less than if they were on leave you'd be giving them a hundred percent of their of their salary that's the way I kind of think through it but I apologize one second Jenny and just very briefly, you know, we, we dealt with this a number of times at the municipal level, specifically with our police department. You have employees who are unable to use the vacation time, even if they had the, you know, the additional amount of time to use it or if they had any time at all to, to be able to use it, especially during the pandemic. You know, you, you could not take a day off as a police officer during the pandemic. You could not work from home as a police officer. And I know that there are many positions um, in, in various, uh, under various auspices in government where, you know, a day off is not a possibility. Um, and given that, you know, we are down about 10 percent of our workforce and given that, that you know, as, as had been mentioned, there are a number of major projects that are ongoing, I think it's probably fairer to, to pay uh, to pay out this this leave rather than, you know, mm -hmm. cease providing certain services for our citizens. And, and I take the point completely that it is not uh, our money. It is the money of taxpayers. Um, but I also, the question that I asked about whether or not it was already built into the budget, it is. So it's not like we're, we're having to extend any additional money other than what was already previously allocated specifically for this kind of thing. Jenny? I just wanted to let you know that if you do carry it over, it does create a larger liability on our balance sheet at the year end. Um, just because of that for financial and then the other thing is and I don't know if many realize this going through the pandemic I know our department personally we had a lot of turnover during that time so um, with that turnover and we have two or three employees in our department alone that have over 40 years um, in and because of that turnover I think we were down like five or six positions people weren't able to take off as much because, I mean, and if you look at the history, I think Ted can validate that there were how many opening position, open positions at that point, which somebody had to pick up the slack during that time, which we're not used to having that many 
open positions during that time and I don't know that we've ever had that amount of time built up in our department even with having those people having that many times so I just wanted to clarify that too I, I appreciate that and uh, I think it would be a different story if uh, we were at 110 percent fill and we're not we're at 85 percent 90 percent fill you know so um, we're asking folks to do a whole lot um, and yeah so I won't say I'm sticking to my guns but I do believe 75 uh, percent um, is appropriate with the longevity and everything else but that's again me um, is there further discussion on this we do have a motion and a second on the on the floor for what was read uh, for a rate of 75% um, of base hourly pay all in favor aye aye, aye. aye. I apologize, Mike. Aye, that was okay, a thank you so much. 5 0. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good work. I had to talk it out a little bit. Yeah. Um, that's what it's all about. That's right. It's better to discuss. It's better to. Yes. Oh, yeah, and it's good we're having this discussion. Yeah, we're, not, we're not just rubber stamping huge. anything. Nope. No, I mean, this, not is, at all. this is good. I'm probably fickle, should, but I changed my mind like three times. We should, we should. <laughs> well, for the record, you guys actually convinced me to vote for it. So that this happened is, right there. Well, Commissioner Guerin, you've convinced you've convinced me of one or two things over time as well. So thank you. He didn't tell you what those were, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> that extra beer, Mako. <laughs> <laughs> All set. Yep. Not All right. not to wear a tie. I'm gonna start taking <laughs> these off. And Good I'm morning, very happy about the morning. morning. Okay, what are we talking about? We're talking about the FY24. Oh gosh, FY24 water and sewer rates. I'm looking forward to this one. You ready? <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> the Department of Public Works, along with the Comptroller's Office and the Office of Management and Budget, have reviewed the utilities enterprise fund and its ability to maintain an effective, proactive approach to day-to-day -day operations with its aging infrastructure. With that, we are recommending a 10% increase to the water and sewer rates. Full adoption of these rates would Full adoption of this rate increase would result in essential projects, which I'll discuss in a few slides, moving forward in FY24. The impact of not adopting these new rates would lead to deferral of projects and the potential need for a larger <coughs> increase for future fiscal years. God bless you. Does this sneeze? <laughs> God bless you. Uh, before we dive into the presentation, I, I did want to take a moment to recognize our staff with the Bureau of Utilities. They are truly the unsung heroes that keep the county's public water and sewer systems running day in and day out. From Dan Crockett, who is treating the water at Liberty Reservoir, to Wendy Armstrong, who is safely discharging treated wastewater back in the streams to Hampstead, to the day-to-day -day leadership of Shana Hausman and Mike Zeckman provide to their crews. I want to personally thank my entire staff and their dedication to Carroll County. So diving into a little bit of the details of the Bureau of Utilities Utility Fund, uh, enterprise fund. Um, it, it provides water and sewer services for specific regions of the county. These areas include water and sewer services to the Freedom District, sewer service to the Hampstead sewer area, water and sewer services to the Pleasant Valley area, and water service to the Bark Hill area. Revenue makeup for this fund includes water and sewer rates, water and sewer maintenance fees, and area connection fees. For those of you not familiar, Bills are issued quarterly, and the usage is dependent on the water meter readings. Maintenance fees are annual charges based on property footage. And finally, area connection fees are collected as new development occurs in these service areas. And the major expenses that come out of this fund are personnel costs. We have 33 staff members, and we are fully staffed. Uh, the operating expenses, day-to-day -day needs of the five separate work units covering water treatment, storage and delivery, and wastewater collection and treatment. And last but not least, our capital program that supports long-term <coughs> infrastructure needs. Like many organizations, the Bureau of Utility is facing rising costs with supply and demand both in materials and service, in addition to past budgets not fully funding our 3R capital program, which is repair, rehabilitation, and replace our existing infrastructure. And the final bullet on this page, I, I want to take a couple minutes to talk about, and I believe it's our biggest challenge. Water and sewer systems are dramatic. 
dynamic. They are constantly changing. Like some of the conversations with Ted regarding income projections, it is difficult to pr pr predict water usage. Who's working from home this week? Will we see a higher usage? Did we have a big rain event? Then we'll need to ramp up operations at the treatment plant. Was a new development built? Then we'll need to reevaluate our pump station settings. I think you get the point. Very difficult to wrap our head around the income projections for the next fiscal year. And as I previously mentioned, I'd just like to take a couple minutes to, to highlight some of the, the bigger projects we have going on across the county. The proposed increase would increase would, would assist in supporting these projects, which are essential to proactively maintaining our infrastructure, and the costs have been included in the recommended budget already. On the water side, we have the Liberty Booster Station. Uh, this project is estimated $3.6 million over the next three fiscal years, uh, again in District 5. Um, it's, a, it's a new booster pump, so, you know, I've had the conversation with Roberta, what, what's, what's a booster pump? Is it a sump <laughs> pump? Is it, you know, something that goes in a car? Um, this, is a, this is a 20 horsepower pump that's used on treated water that pumps out at 347 gallons per minute. And the, the goal of this project is to provide re redundancy <coughs> in the high zone of this, mm -hmm. uh, of this network. Um, Freedom Water Plant, uh, we're looking at two more pumps out here to, to better optimize the, the life and usage of the of, of this system. Um, again, no, no small feat. Those are 200 horsepower uh, pumps uh, pumping at 1,700 gallons per minute. Mm -hmm. And again, this will improve the efficiency of our treatment plant and increase the life. And, and finally, the smart meter program, which we've started rolling out um, kind of piece by piece. We're having some supply and demand issues about getting the parts in and long lead times and getting antennas up. But um, this is a program we continue to push year after year. And this will ultimately allow for us to read um, water meters without even driving by the house. You know, we would put antennas up on cell towers, water towers, and that information would be transmitted over to my friend's financial system right away so we can have the bills ready kind of at our fingertips maybe her new financial system <laughs> maybe <laughs> uh next just some of the sewer projects um on district two the shiloh pump rehabilitation um you know the the hampstead system's getting old and everything kind of filters down to this plant we're seeing a lot of i and i issues that need to be addressed which means increased flows at the pump station so there's some some significant work that's will, will be required out there um, just system-wide uh, repair and replacements of, of the gravity, gravity sewer system. Um, everything from six to ten inch sewer lines just to maintain the existing infrastructure and extend the life of those. You're saying it's getting old like the commissioner? <laughs> just asking. <laughs> Everybody gets old. Oh, okay. <laughs> and it's finally, uh, Commissioner Ross, Don't I think one you're familiar just with saying. this. Um, it's a good thing to keep <laughs> getting older. Oh, it is. <laughs> You're familiar with the Kara Highlands odor issues down there. Um, we, we have money allocated to install an odor control system that would alleviate the problem and, and increase the, the quality of the air in this area. Yeah. <laughs> um, finally, before I wrap up, um, I just wanted to show how this increase would affect the average user. So this is what we define as somebody that uses about 12,000 gallons um, in their billing cycle, which is about 133 gallons a day. Uh, your typical family of four, you know, bathing kids, taking showers, cooking, running the dishwasher. Um, the increase of their bill would be approximately $27.76, which equates to a monthly household budget increase of $9.25, so maybe one of your Starbucks drinks these days. Um, and I think Mr. Watcher commented last time what it broke down per day. Uh, we're looking at 31 cents a day for these for these users. So again, thank you for your time and consideration. Um, I'll now hand it over to Jenny if she wanted to add anything from the financial side. If not, she has uh, some some data ready if you have questions. Well, I mean, you make it sound, you, you did a great job in the presentation, first off. And uh, to my colleagues, if you haven't been out to the facilities, uh, really recommend it. Um, you know, uh, very complex um, and people don't, I don't didn't understand um, the complexity of it to allow us to turn on the faucet and drink some good water and do the things we do at our homes. But uh, and I really appreciate um, you giving recognition to your staff and your team. Uh, I truly do. 
the last time we increased rates was just a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. And it was frustrating because it was a large increase in rates and percentages. Um, now, rates are those that use the water and sewer, and that's where rates should go. It's not taxes. Um, however, a large part of it is in, you know, the District 5, Eldersburg, Sykesville area, and uh, up in Hampstead, and they get hit. So I understand the $28, but it's that, you know, concern of, okay, when are we going to stop raising rates? Um, and maybe, Jenny, I, I don't know, is there an expectation of, okay, this is going into FY24, we should be looking at incremental rate increases every two years, four years, eight years. I mean, so how, we did how do, we do a that? three year rate okay. adoption a couple years ago. Um, yeah. I think it was right before the pandemic. I'm trying to remember yeah. in my book here, maybe it was 2017. Um, honestly, on a financial side, and depending on what the projects that DPW needs for or the Bureau of Utilities, it doesn't work. This is um, an enterprise fund, basically a business fund that needs to be reevaluated every year to make sure that we are covering the cost properly. Um, where is it going to end? It depends on the number of projects. That's really what it is with an aging infrastructure. That is what we need to look at as far as a plan and know our offices along with budget have been working to try to figure out a plan for that but the enterprise funds don't minimize the the rate cost does it so the budget drives the rates the budget in the enterprise fund drives the rate so whatever is adopted in the budget um, that is what creates the rate cost does Okay, maybe uh, I think I'm on. I, I'm just trying to. F- understand this is kind this of the simple. opposite of your regular general fund and your property tax, where you know what you're going to collect because yeah. we have control yeah. over how much. This we don't have a control over what someone's going to use, and then but we do have a control over our budget in determining, and we have to yeah. say this is how much we need in order to cover that cost. Okay, and, and to just because you can add, you can feed off of this very simple question i just looking for a simple answer so somebody can say why are my rates going up another fifty dollars and I, I i got all this but you know enough is enough and i don't want to be so callous to them saying well because you're on but we are cal i mean that's the reality um but we just i thought we just did this a couple years ago maybe we didn't um, just adopted in 23. We did. You adopted yeah. a rate increase from right. 22 okay. to 23. Yeah. yeah, that's what I thought. But I think, um, and I'd be curious, um, I've got a couple questions, but you made me think. Um, there is inflation. There is costs that are increasing every year. But the projects, you, you've got a number of large projects. Um, I don't know how quickly you can come off the top of your head, but... Um, what would they have cost four or five years ago? Um, not what they're costing today. So, so, so uh, some of that, the inflation and some of that drives all this. Yeah. Um, but I'm also curious, what happens if somebody can't pay their bill? What happens if people are on fixed income and this takes them to the breaking point? What are their policies for that? So we, had, we work with the customer um, they do. They are allowed to have four open bills before we turn them off. We do not turn them off during the winter months. Um, we also were working with Citizen Services to see with some grants that were out there. We did not turn anyone off during the pandemic. Um, we try to work with the citizen prior to even thinking of turning them off. They get notices and things like that so we're all the time I know my staff in the utilities building um, is all the time working with that staff that person um, even trying to see if we can work out some kind of deal unfortunately the system won't allow us to do partial payments but that's kind of one of the thing of hey can you say save up so much um, but really reaching out to Celine we send the turnoff list to that department 
mm-hmm. every time so that they can reach out to those people. Okay. And so I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, and, and, and I'm like your citizens probably, but I can't blame these guys. I'm not happy when I <laughs> fill my car up with gas. I'm not happy when I go buy a loaf of bread and a gallon of milk. And, and that hits the, all the cost involved in these enterprise funds too. <clears throat> Oh, no, no, Commissioner Collard, no worries at all. Uh, so just a couple of questions, and if you do not have the information with you, I have no worries, I totally understand. So you'd mentioned that there was a rate increase from 22 to 23. Do I have that correct? How much was that, and in conjunction or in, in addition to that, how much would this potential 10% be in combination with that? So between 22 and 24, what, how much more money would a citizen have to pay for water and sewer? I don't have, I have the actual rates, I don't have the percentages broke down of what Other, and, and that's all right, we can, we can talk about 20. it another, another day, but I, I guess sure. part of the point that I'm making is that, and, and again, this is no, nothing demeaning about you guys at all whatsoever. You know, when we consider uh, a 10% rate increase for one year, it looks like, yes, it's just $27.76 for this coming year, but then you take into account that this is over what it was raised previously, and so you have, like, a, you know, accumulation of costs over time, and so that's the kind of thing that I worry about. Um, uh, what are the actual rates themselves? If I was living out in the country, what am I paying for a, a you know, gallon of water? It's very complicated. It's, it's not as easy to answer that question. Um, we, can, we can talk offline about that, but we have different rate categories depending on how much usage you use. And it also depends on the front footage of your house. So there's a, there's a base fee, which kind of takes care of the maintenance. And then there's the component that takes care of the water usage. So, so it varies. So, so is it fair then to say that there would be an average increase of 2776 because there are different? Yeah, yeah. So, so we took the most popular tier of, of users in the system, and that's what we kind of ran these numbers that we just presented on. All right, and so, so my final question, and Ted, you may have to jump in on this one, but so is it, are there certain capital projects that we can say use surplus money from this year's budget to pay or to pay for that would help offset or eliminate the potential rate increases that we're talking about today? Can you correct me, but I believe no, because it's only, it doesn't affect the whole county? Right, it's a separate fund. Okay, I'll answer that, then I want to go back to some other bigger (laughs) ideas. Well, I think the answer is yes, you you could, but this is set up as an enterprise fund with its own (laughs) revenues and expenditures, and it is not part of any thinking to use general tax dollars in order to fund this. So even though they are surplus dollars, they were still tax dollars. Uh, To make that move would be a a huge shift in policy. Now, um, I get that. I'm I'm trying to to look at this from all sides to to find, you know, as we were talking about with the the payouts for the accumulated leave, are there other alternatives that, that we can potentially explain? Not to say that you have not, but for the sake of our discussion, are there other avenues that we could pursue before you know, considering a rate increase? I'd, I'd say at this point, no, but I think our future plan, we, we do have plans to do a commercial water audit. Uh, we've already started looking at some of the numbers for that. Um, and then the other kind of piece of that would be com- consumer outreach and just talking to folks, make sure they know about their leaky toilet and how to fix it, um, how to identify, you know, if, if they have a leak in their service lateral. Um, just community outreach to to help and to mm-hmm. to be that face and kind of educate them as much as possible yeah, def- although, although that's an interesting point because the less people use and like with low flush toilets and things like that we're using less water that actually puts pressure on the rates because the paradox the less, of it all right yeah so it's, it's yeah, yeah. yeah yeah there are, a lot of the costs are fixed there are variable costs but you know um If we could drive usage way down, our problems would actually go up. So a couple big ideas here. Commissioner Rothstein said, so where does this end? And the simple answer is it it doesn't, it can't. Uh, To Commissioner Kyler's point, um, costs go up. Now I guess in theory, if we had costs that started going down, that would change this, but I don't think anybody is expecting that to happen. And this is really, very simple in a sense. I mean, there's a lot of details behind it, but we can calculate what it costs us to run the system. 
if there are not going to be any general tax dollars in, in the mix, once you know how much it costs to run the system, you know how much revenue that you need, and that is just math to say what are the rates going, going to be. I don't believe anybody could go to utilities and say, I can find lots of ways to save money here. I don't believe there's an expenditure side fix for, for doing this. So what you're left with is a choice between approving the rates that you can calculate or saying, no, we're not going to. The consequence of that is something that needs to get done isn't going to get done. And we've been there before. And I also want to make sure you, um, Brian showed you a short list of capital projects. There's a very long list of, of capital projects, and that will never go away either. You know, the pumping station that is getting done this year, and I'm not saying this is the right number, but 20 years from now is going to have to be redone again. Uh, we, have a, we have a system that will always be in constant need of renewal. So my, I understand the reluctance of approving increases in water and, and sewer rates. I have never seen any commissioner or any board say, oh, please, let us raise the rates. Can we do it some more? Uh, but it's, it's just a fact of the, of the life of having uh, a, a system. This is what we, we need to do. And commissioners will often go to, well, can we phase this in? Or can we compromise on, on the rate? Anything you do other than approve the necessary rate means there's not enough revenue. And Brian and Andy are left to say, OK, what are we not going to do? And there are consequences. Maybe they're not tomorrow, but there are consequences of not doing the things we need to do. Yeah, I, no. think, I think your point, if you put off the projects, maintenance is going to go up and up. You know, I, I used to argue. Uh, a new D6 is about the same cost per hour as one 10 years old. One, one doesn't need repairs and has a limited warranty. The other one you're fixing all the time. So we, you, can't af you can't afford to put off projects after a certain point. I believe, um, you know, my crystal ball is that this is going to move forward, you know, because it has to move forward. I am challenged that the last time I sat here, and we talked about rates. The conversation was, well, we hadn't raised rates in a long period of time. And this was the, that was the first time that they raised rates. Um, and I'm like, well, why didn't they raise them as costs were increasing and they need to raise? And it was this attitude, we're not going to raise rates. We're not going to raise taxes. We're not going to put the burden on our community. I understand that. But if you don't do it you know, in a methodical approach, then it all comes crashing down, and all of a sudden, the cost goes way up on these type of rates. And that's what happened last time, uh, from what I recalled. Um, and uh, <clears throat> that, that's why it's so important to just put it all out there, because this has to be funded. You know, there's not, if it can or not, I mean, it, like Ted said, and like you've been saying, that's what frustrated me last time when I sat up here was, you know, the the comments of we hadn't done this in so long, and my colleagues are like, well, now it's time to do it. I'm like, well, why didn't you do it mm -hmm. five years ago when it was in your face then, or four years ago, or three years ago? So um, that that's my only frustration in this. Um, but uh, I understand the need. And I'll move the Board of Commissioners approve the inclusion of a water usage rate increase of 10% and a sewer usage rate increase of 10% with the FY24 budget adoption. Second. I have a motion, I have a second. Is there further discussion? I would request Please. that we wait just because there's some more information that I'd like to see before oh. personally making a decision on this one way or the other. If you want to move forward, that's fine, but I, I can't vote for it because I don't have the information that I want in front of me. Okay. What, just curious, what information, so we're clear? Is information about rates and, and certain things like that. Okay. I, and I apologize. I didn't no, want to no, jump no, the gun. No, no worries. No worries. 
<clears throat> um, okay, well, we do have a motion and a second. Discussion point, I mean, do we want to continue on with this? Um, I, just, I do have a question. Sorry, I, I know we're, I know we're, we're going, we're spending a lot of time on things we didn't think we spent a lot of time on and vice versa. <laughs> So I just want to make sure I understand. You're looking at some rate increases to pay for some capital projects. But we also fund certain capital projects that look a lot like some of these things as well. So what, what exactly, I want to make sure I understand this, because this is a fairly new concept to me. <clears throat> uh, can, can you shed some light on that? I know I recognize some of these things, and we've spent county dollars either upgrading them or replacing them, no? Well, they all come from the enterprise fund. Yeah, okay, so should, yeah. Yeah. let him explain. Yeah. Okay, uh, say, say again what you're asking. I just want to make sure I understand that we're not looking at two different funding sources here. I see a lot of these projects, we've, gone, we've, we've debated some of these before and funded them in terms of capital projects, whether it's upgrades or fixes or things like that. These increases are going to maintain some of these things. There is not another revenue stream doing so. I just want to confirm that's the case. Right. Uh, all, all, the, all these projects are, are funded out of the enterprise fund. The, the one exception, we've got federal money for a, yeah. a few things. It's right? on this slide. Yeah, right we actually have a $750,000 benefit instead of being just a $200 million project. It's a, it's a yeah. $1.1 million. So. But, uh, oh, but to your point, no local tax dollars are going into these projects. Okay. I just, that, th and thank you. Again, for, for me, uh, free people from, from my part of the county, we're not really used to, you know, this type of discussion. We have, if you live within the town, you're, you're paying rates, but usually you're on well and septic if you're not. So, yes. uh, Okay. And one, so, oh, so oh, if I may, so yes, this board has seen Andy in front of you many, many times, you know, buying pumps and doing repairs and water meter vaults and all that good stuff. All <laughs> of that, when it says within the adopted budget, et cetera, et cetera, it's all coming from this enterprise fund that any of these rate increases would go to. Yeah, and one mechanical thing I want to make sure you understand. Uh, we need the board to approve these rates so that we can then build that into your proposed budget. The, the rates don't fully come, not even fully, the rates are not in place until you adopt your budget. That's part of right. the, the budget adoption. So this is step one to get the budget and then step two would be adopting the budget. And I think it goes without saying, let's say let's say you're the only one not ready to vote and therefore this passes four to one, you still have questions that, that he needs answered. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah no doubt. I'm, I'm, Anytime. I'm, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm prepared to vote on it today, but you know, again, for, for me personally, I, I think this is, this is a part of a, a cautionary tale on growth and development. Growth and development does bring in tax revenues. It brings in things like property taxes and assessment, but it also costs people money. I mean, it's, it's a double-edged sword. So, yep, well said. I absolutely agree. And and another thing, <clears throat> this is another complex mm -hmm. system that we deal with that a lot of times, I don't think it's overlooked, but not as understood. The whole enterprise fund and rates compared to taxes. And okay, okay, I have a motion. I have a second. Any other discussion on this? Seeing here, none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Against no. or abstained? No. Okay. Okay, 4 1. Okay. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank, Thank you. you. Go away, do some work. <laughs> <laughs> um, Chris, anybody on the, on the phone? No one on the line, sir. Okay, anything for open admin? Um, okay. Just uh, close minutes. Minutes. Yeah, yeah. Close minutes. Um, just before, just a couple real quick things because I, I mentioned the American Legion and the Vietnam there's also my appreciation for my colleagues also that have worn the uniform uh, and it goes well beyond that because it's my colleagues willingness to do that selflessly their families and the community at large so it's not just one or the other but it's it's all of us um, also next week on Wednesday Evening is the start of Passover, so a house meach, um, Pesach to those that celebrate. Um, and 
I'm going to say just thoughts and prayers to our Pope, um, who is in the hospital with respiratory uh, challenges, and hopefully he will be out by Sunday, which is Palm Sunday. So I think, uh, you know, let's keep him in our thoughts as well. Um, just saying what's on my mind. Uh, close minutes from, what were they for? For land acquisition on what day? Last Thursday, right? Correct. Like March, March 23rd. 23rd. Yeah, last Thursday. March, okay, so I need uh, a motion for the closed minutes for land acquisition on March 23rd. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Seeing here none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Come on, Ms. Wanda. Let's go through our agendas. On Monday, April 3rd, we have nothing scheduled. On Tuesday, April 4th, it'll be down in the Reagan room at 9 o'clock. It'll be our first uh, work session. Um, and then in the afternoon, we will continue uh, with our work sessions. At 3 p.m., uh, Commissioner Garen will be down Mount Airy for ribbon cutting on the Mount Airy Rails to Trails. Yeah, we have to just. Uh, yeah, that, that may not happen, I understand. Yeah. No. Sorry. That's right. <clears throat> Maybe too tight. Thursday, we're going to open session at 9 a.m. We have a couple of uh, Art of Carroll proclamations. Then we're going to go into uh, annual plan for FY23 for Carroll County Bureau of Housing. For 23, not 24. Okay. Bureau of Westminster Annexation, uh, Stone Chapel, LLC. <coughs> it will be a follow on from today's conversation. <coughs> Uh, the formal adoption of the Carroll County Hazard Mitigation Plan. <clears throat> we will talk about pavement repairs of Curtis Court, EPW, and then uh, Mr. Degas will come in and talk to us about Cape Horn Park Lighting. Um, and then DPW will come in and talk to us about a task order uh, number seven and number eight for Delta Oh, for the Delta Airport consultants. Those are the consultants that we use regarding the Westminster, regarding the airport. Um, let's see, then we go into open, or excuse me, then we transition uh, downstairs. Yeah, you start up here for the we'll start up here and then we'll go downstairs for a work session. <clears throat> um, and then we'll go into closed for land acquisition. At 4.30 p.m., there is a drug court, uh, drug treatment court graduation where commissioners Gordon Kyler and myself will be attending. Um, and I'll tell you, if it work sessions go long, then we'll play it by ear then. Friday, Saturday, nothing scheduled. Commissioner Gordon has the podcast on the 9th. Um, Friday, April 7th, the county office buildings. Our offices will be closed also. Mm -hmm. For Easter? Good Friday? Is that Good Friday? Okay. So, Friday, April 7th. Is that a federal holiday or no? No. No? no. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but office buildings will be closed. Um, Monday, April 10th. There's a Westminster City Council meeting. I take it that uh, Commissioner Gordon will be attending? Probably, yes. Um, on Tuesday, April 11th, back down in the dungeon for another work session, both in the morning and the afternoon. And then I'll be attending the Ag Center board meeting at 7 p.m. And Commissioner Kyler and I will be also at the Ag Board uh, or Ag Center for the 4-H Achievement Program. So there on Wednesday morning, there's a farm museum board meeting. I take it uh, Commissioner Vigliotti should be attending that. And then a board of education joint meeting. What? 
Board of Education joint. I think that was tentatively I scheduled. Think that I was don't. tentative yeah. a long time ago, yeah. but I think both sides have agreed it's not necessary. At this point, right. yeah. So yeah, let's take that joint meeting out. We tried to schedule them in advance just to, mm -hmm. to have okay. something on the calendar. No, no problem. Yeah. There is, however, at 5 p.m., a Board of Education uh, board meeting. Um, we need to see if someone takers. wants to attend. Right. Um, you know, I was really hoping I'd be able to go, but it is Seder, so I cannot attend. So I just happen to have to not attend that one but if we can get a taker that'd be great um on thursday april 13th actually that's not Seder. that's the end of passover uh ooh, i may have just jumped in it april, <laughs> april 13th uh we go into open session hey when this happens um request approval for grant application and acceptance award you could put me down for the board of ed at 5 p.m okay. on the 13th on the 12th, excuse me. Um, New Windsor Wetland Construction Plans. Mr. Hine will be talking to us. Request approval for grant application regarding Roberts Field Restoration <coughs> Construction. Approval of the adoption resolution Carroll County Hazard Mitigation Plan. Ms. Hawkins will be talking with us. We will have Legal Services Bond Council, uh, Ms. Hobbs, our comptroller, Financial Auditing Services, she will stay with us, and then Financial Advisor Services. Then we will go into closed for public safety, um, dealing with public nuisance ordinances. Mr. Burke will navigate us through those discussions. And we'll a have a very some, soft voice. We'll have some other guests, uh, law okay. enforcement. But you're not the nuisance. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, no, I, that was a fact. That wasn't a question. FY24 proposed budget work session at 1115 on Thursday. Friday, April 14th, Commissioner Vigliotti will be attending the Tony Town Business Breakfast over at the... Uh, Bowling alley, typically, right? Yep. But this year or this oh. time, they're doing it at Venue Bouchon because of the uh, guests. Secretary of Commerce, nice. Kevin Anderson. Okay, so you got the Secretary of uh, Commerce coming in. Uh, Everybody's back. welcome to attend if anybody uh -huh. wants to go. Roberta, I am attending. Oh, cool. Um, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 6:30 p.m. is Battle of the Books at Century High School, uh, where I'll be emceeing, and Commissioner Kyler. I don't know if you're emceeing or just attending the Battle of Books at Manchester Valley. Attending and awarding. Attending and awarding. And then Commissioner Gordon, are you uh, emceeing or just attending? Uh, attending. At the Westminster High School Battle of the Books. Attending. On Saturday, April 15th, Westminster Baseball Program opening day. Commissioner Gordon will have his opportunity to throw a baseball, I would expect. And then ribbon cutting at Sweet Bay Farms Nursery and Garden Center in Westminster. Are you attending that? Uh, I'm not certain of that yet. I don't know. <laughs> and then Commissioner Garen has podcast on the 16th. Okay. Is there anything else for this morning? Did I do okay for you, Wanda? Okay. I need a motion for recess until 1 p.m. where we'll go into agency briefings. Motion to recess until 1 o'clock p.m. Second. <laughs> Any, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. <laughs>